So to call the Port Authority meeting to order, um, Erickson? Here. Bussey? Here. Carter? Here. Hunt? Here. Keller? Here. Lunds? Here. Peterson? Not here. And for the council. Good, good evening. I'll, I'll take care of it, uh, Carolyn. Good evening, everyone. This is uh, called, calling to order the city council portion of the city council and Port Authority joint meeting this evening. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, reminded everybody we are being broadcast. We're on television across the great city of Bloomington. So be on your best behavior. And uh, I, I need to, if I could, call the, uh, the roll for the <clears throat> city council. Council Member Beloga. Here. Council Member Carter. Here. Council Member Coulter. Present. Council Member Lohman. Council Member Martin. Present. Council Member Nelson. Here. And uh, I am here as well. The records show that all seven members of the Bloomington City Council are present. And let the record show also that Steve Peterson just arrived. Steve? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, well, Mr. Mayor, I, I guess we've got some Port Authority minutes to approve first, so if, if it's okay, I'll, we can do that, and then we can go into the main agenda. So I would entertain a motion for the approval of the Port Authority minutes from the meeting of February 2nd, 2021. So moved by Peterson. We have a motion made. Do we have a second? Second. And by, was it Hunt? I believe it was by Commissioner was Carter. Okay, thank you. So Carolyn, you got both those? Okay, are there any additions or corrections? Mr. Yes. Chair, I, Mr. Chair? Yes. I will not vote, I was not at that meeting. Okay. Likewise. All right, so. <clears throat> Both Commissioners Keller and Hunt will not be voting. Okay. Uh, any anything else? Otherwise, I would ask Carolyn to call the roll. Carolyn, I believe Carolyn. you're muted. Erickson. Hi. Rusty. Hi. Carter. Hi. Buns. Abstain. Keller. Abstain. Lunds. Aye. Peterson. Aye. Five with two abstentions. The minutes are approved. Thank you. Very good on our agenda this evening. We've got. Uh, one item of new business, uh, the Mall of America Update and Hospitality Project funding. I know we've got a, a number of folks, a uh, number of presentations. I would ask that uh, members of both the City Council and the Port Authority, if you could please remember to mute your microphones if you're not speaking. It just uh, cuts down on the background noise and, and uh, some of the uh, chatter in the background are greatly appreciated. But if, uh, with your approval, Mr. President, I think we should turn it over to uh, Mr. Rudlang from the uh, um, Port Authority and uh, have him lead us through this. Yes, I would do that. And I also just would remind you and anybody else that if we can't, if somebody has a question, please remember, I can't see anybody. And I don't think you either can, Mr. Mayor, on the screen. So uh, please uh, make your presence known somehow if you want to speak. Thank you. Yep, that is correct. Yeah, please don't be shy. If you have a question, just speak up. So Shane, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, uh, President Erickson, and Port Authority Members. So tonight, um, we are here to talk about a number of things related to the hospitality industry and Mall of America. And so uh, it, it's been a few years um, since we've kind of gone through the mall project uh, in general. Um, so I'm going to do just kind of a short history of the mall, which is also included in the agenda materials. Um, we'll talk about TIF and the financial impact of the mall, the hotels and how COVID is all worked into that. 
we'll talk about diversification through um, doing projects that aren't the mall and aren't hotels in South Loop and uh, generally. And then we've got some folks from the Mall of America, Kurt Hagen and Joe Renslow. Uh, they'll give a mall and triple five update generally. And then the council and court will consider action related to amending the city's legislative policy to help deliver projects that, that drive um, hospitality. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that, we'll just get right into it. And um, so back in the day, um, the site of the Met um, Center and the Met Stadium we're home to the North Star Hockey team, the Minnesota Twins and the Minnesota Vikings. And in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, those teams made a move to other locations in the Metro, which left um, a number of sites available in what's now called South Loop, which was then called Airport South, to, to redevelop. And um, there's a lot of process between the Port Authority and the council. Um, you know, Bob Erickson was part of that, maybe one of the, uh, only folks on the Port Authority. I know um, uh, Port Commissioner Hunt was on the Planning Commission when this went through. And um, there was a lot of process back then. Ultimately, it ended up um, being decided that they were gonna build the Mall of America. And that was a consortium of uh, the port and the city and Triple uh, Five with the concept for the Mall of America. Um, Simon Property Groups was the managing entity and TIAA CREF for the teachers um, retirement accounts was the, the financial entity that backstopped uh, the majority of the debt for the project and the mall was built. Um, and in uh, 1992, uh, the project opened um, with 71% occupancy and 330 stores. And there was a recession happening at the time, but the mall project has turned out to be very successful. Um, phase one building with the four anchors, um, two of which are now closed and looking to uh, be repurposed into other things. And, um, uh, the TIF and the liquor and lodging funding um, built the parking ramps and other infrastructure related to the project. And the building itself was privately financed. <clears throat> um, in the 90s and 2000s, there was a number of things that happened. Um, there was some lawsuits between the ownership entities, which ended up um, in 2006 with Triple Five becoming the sole owner of the mall and uh, teachers and Simon exiting the project. And soon after that, IKEA was built. And then um, in 2011, um, we started a couple of other projects with Radisson Blue. And then in 2013, 14, and 15, we did um, the Phase 1C project, which was the JW Marriott, the office building, and the additional retail. And in 16, there was a new redevelopment contract that was executed, and I'll go into that here in a little bit. Um, so Radisson Blue on the south side of the mall, Fancy pictures of that, <clears throat> and then the JW Marriott on the north side with the office and other retail. Um, we went through a long process during that time period to create um, some goals for public investment in South Loop. I won't go through each one of those, but this is a um, culmination of a lot of work that uh, ended up in 2016, now five years ago, which is amazing how time flies. <clears throat> And then objectives for doing the master contract uh, redo in 2016. And again, I won't go through those um, either um, in each one, except for maybe pointing out bullet two that, you know, one of the key things was to support the long-term viability of the mall, um, which of course has been severely impacted by COVID. So this is what it looks like today from, from, the, uh, from the air, phase 1C in the north, uh, Radisson Bowl in the south and Ikea. At center site to the north, um, looking to be redeveloped um, parking lot today and adjoining lands to the east. And in the 2000s, of course, the pandemic over the last year has been extremely challenging um, for the city and the mall and, and lots of other folks for lots of reasons. And, you know, into the future for 2021 and beyond, we want to continue to focus on diversification without losing sight of the benefit that the mall um, and the retail and tourism industry. Um, have on the city's budget. <clears throat> what the future may hold, we don't know today, but we know we're going to develop that land north of the mall, and um, what that ends up becoming is is something that changes. And um, I don't even want to say how many plans that I've seen, and I know um, folks from the mall are on the line too. How many plans, different plans, have been developed for that site? Um, 
through the years, dozens, maybe more than dozens. In any case, um, our public investment in the project um, is about 164 million in capital um, cost, doesn't include interest, um, neither does the mall's private investment um, of about 1.1 billion, doesn't include interest on the debt that they've paid, but um, in gross capital costs, these are the numbers. So the TIF districts that were, um, that existed uh, for the traditional collection of TIF on the mall phase one and phase two sites, the Met Center and um, at city and properties ended in 2016 and 18. And that's, um, they're still technically open for this um, TIF that was created out of the 2013 legislation. But for the traditional collection of TIF, those districts are um, not decertified. They just um, stopped collecting regular TIF. And now they collect uh, the TIF that was created out of 2013. 2013 was also, also the approval of the South Loop District Plan, um, which was, um, a, you know, acknowledging of the mall's importance to the district, but really focused on trying to do um, things outside of the mall, in particular the Bloomington Central Station development, and then expanding on that Bloomington Central Station model of grid streets, mixed use, transit oriented development, which um, we're really seeing an uptick now in the past couple of years, even during COVID. It's been the one uh, development bright spot during COVID for sure. So the South Loop plan um, to make a walkable urban neighborhood, um, leveraging the unique character and assets. I won't go through these goals again. Um, you all have seen them many times. <clears throat> so the mall is, you know, very important to the city's finances um, with a 2020 estimated market value of about 1.15 billion. Um, it's about 10% of the city's tax base. There's lots of different ways to measure that number. Um, we've got 46 to 48 hotels in town. The difference there is how you measure the dual branded hotels. I just call it 47. Um, and the hotels are about 7% of the tax base. So collectively it's about 17% of the tax base on just the property tax side. Um, the general fund levy, and there's lots of different ways we can uh, measure the general fund versus the levy versus the budget versus the general fund levy portion of the levy. Um, but just uh, it's in the 54, you know, you can, even measure it up to $80 million, but it's in that range. And lodging and admission taxes that go to the city's general fund are about 10 million annually. And you can see, you know, if the city had to levy an additional $10 million to provide the same services that we provide today, that would be a huge hit to the existing tax base in Bloomington. If you simply took the mall out of the Bloomington tax base, the impact on the median value of home is about um, 100 bucks more a year. Um, that does not consider the liquor and lodging taxes, which are a, certainly an add to the city's budget. Um, but it also doesn't consider the cost of city services. Obviously, having projects um, built, you know, provide new taxes in the form of property taxes to the city's uh, coffers, but they also cost. Um, the real add, the real plus up that Bloomington has benefited from for a long time are the lodging and admission taxes. And that's something that a lot of cities don't have and that a lot of cities would love to have, frankly. Um, we also fund uh, about $1.5 to $2 million um, out of the South Loop Development Fund. Um, that's the liquor and lodging money that uh, subsidize certain city services, which are allowed that the general fund doesn't have to pay for. So you could easily justify about another million and a half of benefit to the general fund because of um, the liquor and lodging taxes. On the residential side, um, the effects of values in Bloomington are more um, are, are felt more directly because the, roughly speaking, it's about a third, a third, a third between the county, the city, and the school district. Um, there are other agencies, the Mosquito Control District and other things like that, that make up the property tax bill. But um, when a project is in TIF, um, all of those um, entities are, are collected with the exception of part of the Bloomington School District um, tax because and I, um, I won't go into, nor do I, nor, nor am I an expert on how um, the property tax and the school funding works, so I won't go there. Um, but on the commercial side, it's a little bit more diluted, um, and the benefit of commercial projects is a little bit more diluted to the Bloomington tax base um, because of how um, the property tax dollar is split on, uh, split on commercial, with about 30% going to fiscal disparities, 
uh, 22% going to the state general, and then another 15, 15, 15 ish going to the three locals with 4% um, going to other agencies. And so um, when a project like the mall comes out of TIF as it did back in 2016, um, it's felt significantly um, in some ways and also not significantly in other ways. Um, in 2016, when the project came out of, uh, of TIF, um, lots of people's taxes were maybe um, flat to down a couple of percent, even though um, the levy was increased that year. But um, it went out, out of TIF with, without a lot of fanfare, frankly. On the hotel side, um, Bloomington is um, edging up to 10,000 rooms in town. Um, again, we've added about 157 hotel rooms per year since 1960, which is, is a steady clip. And I know there's been a fair amount of discussion about the reliance on, on lodging and admissions taxes in the general fund. Um, but again, um, these things are, are really nice to have ads that lots of cities would, would love to have. Um, but um, we all recognize, the, especially during the pandemic, the reliance um, that we have on these funds when they, when they don't aren't there anymore. And um, in 2019, you had about $8.6 million in lodging tax for the general fund. Those are the blue bars there in the month, <clears throat> excuse me. And the pandemic in orange, um, you know, just devastating to those businesses in town. Obviously there was an impact to the city's budget, which we all lived through. Um, and the gray bar is a percent of 2019. So we're hovering over the past six months at call it 30% of revenue. And while we don't share the um, specific hotel um, data per hotel, but in mass, obviously that's a huge impact to the um, hospitality industry to be at 30% uh, of revenue. So that's not counting expenses that's not profit that's just 30 percent of revenue which of course is really really tough on those businesses admissions taxes most of this tax is generated at the mall in fact it's high 90s percent and so you know when the mall was closed um you know at the, the depths of the pandemic and q2 of 2020 um, there was practically zero admissions tax and that's been um, limited in, in large part due to the governor's restrictions on um, occupancy in Nickelodeon Park and other, other venues. And so that, that's been really impacted and we'll get January and, and uh, February numbers um, here pretty quickly, but that data always lags a bit. And then you've seen this before too, um, but I think you know one of the reasons why Bloomington's taxes are on the low end of the scale is due to the fact that um, we have this ad in our budget, the liquor um, lodging and admissions taxes that, that go to, to help do the things that we all do in the city of Paul streets, provide sewer and water, et cetera. Um, yes, I think we do things very efficiently and we're a smart organization, but you can't deny the fact that you've got about $10 million coming in that uh, a lot of other cities don't have. The problem with, with this today is that, you know, the pandemic has been hard on this industry, and this is a national graph from Smith Travel Research. Um, we get updates from these folks every every week, and we track this data very closely, but this is a national graph. And um, they also, they, they include the best markets that recover, um, and they also note the worst markets. And unfortunately, the Minneapolis market has been you near know, the bottom of the list or the bottom of the list um, consistently. And I think this is gonna be a really um, important thing for us to watch um, as the pandemic improves. I know President Biden today said, everybody will be able to be vaccinated or at least have access to a vaccine at the, by the end of May, maybe leak into June a little bit, but we'll be watching closely how the, the industry recovers um, when that happens. Um, but we have not done as well. And I think that speaks to people being able to work remotely, um, no business travel. And if there is leisure travel, especially during the winter, um, most people are not headed to Minneapolis. They're headed to Florida or, or some warmer destination. And um, this is a, a concerning trend. And um, if it sticks, it's gonna be a big problem, um, which, you know, the pandemic could, be an ultimate, you know, negative to this region. You know, there's a lot of articles about um, folks um, working remotely and or moving out of cities and things like that. 
And so you combine those trends, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul Metro doesn't have either the advantage of, um, uh, you know, being um, in, in the warm climates that some of these uh, uh, areas do. And so, you know, will our Fortune 500 companies be able to retain the kind of dominance that we've had? Um, and the office market, will it return? And will people need to, to be in Minnesota if to work for these companies is something that um, is going to be really interesting to watch. So, you know, uh, th this additional money that we get through the lodging, liquor, and admission tax allows the city to do um, a number of its strategic priorities. Some of the projects that we work on um, are directly in line with the strategic priorities and others um, simply just help out the, the general fund in order for the city to be able to do those types of things. Um, one of them is uh, that we've heard a fair amount about um, is diversification of the tax base, and in particular, the Bloomington and, and Felt Loop economy. Um, in 2015, in particular, responding to um, some, some terroristic threats, frankly, um, that caused a downturn at Mall of America, we focused on um, both terrorism and, in particular, uh, just you know, e-commerce and other um, economic shocks that we knew were going to happen to the retail economy and other economies. I mean, you know, there's a recession every, you know, there's 2001 recession, 2007, eight recession, um, obviously the pandemic recession. Um, 2015, you know, we weren't thinking pandemic. Um, we weren't that smart, but we were thinking that there was going to be an impact for, from e-commerce and potentially from terrorism that would cause, cause us trouble. Um, and so you know, how do you mitigate that? Um, so what you do is you redouble your efforts uh, to focus on other types of things, you know, housing. And that's the thing that's really taken off, especially during the pandemic. Um, the council in Port deserve credit for taking a risk in Indigo, but that has really just spawned a, a huge growth in residential projects and South Loop Fenley at BCS is now open. Rosa, um, Arter, and Quinn uh, were approved in 2020 during the pandemic. Um, hopefully they'll uh, break ground on Rosa and Arter this spring. That's the plan. The Crown Plaza is looking at a conversion to a, an apartment. There's a senior project uh, that's right there in South Loop at Apple Tree. The BCS um, group is looking at another project, another big 400 unit project. And then Park and Go is also looking at things that are a little bit further behind than these others, but huge amount of interest in residential out there. And it's really um, made way uh, only through the, the kind of the risk that the city and port took by funding and helping fund Indigo and proving that South Loop can have residential on that side and it can be successful. Uh, Fenley just had a really good month in February after a really bad month in January uh, for leasing up. So things are going better out there than they were um, uh, during the heart, heart of the winter. And then businesses, um, you know, we worked with Polar Fab. This has been a while now, but realizing that we've got some sectors in South Loop that like the cluster and that these jobs are really good to have in our city. Um, Polar and then their Skywater Technologies and more recently SIC, keeping that um, these tech companies in the city, um, keeping them happy, and working on others. We've got a few others that are in the pipeline that hopefully we'll be able to deliver at some point um, in the near future. They're sick. Um, other types of uh, diversification um, at the uh, element site. Um, element is here. This isn't actually what it looks like. Um, this is AC by Marriott, and of course, we invested um, in the parking ramp to allow a restaurant and a coffee shop to be built in South Loop, further diversifying the area and, and you know, providing an amenity to office workers and others. Um, unfortunately, the grind didn't make it through the pandemic, um, but we're working with um, and talking to David Peters about some other options there. Bloomington Central Station continues to thrive. Again, Indigo is the big move. And then here's a, just a graphic of those residential projects that and red are the ones that are complete, and the yellow are the ones that are in various stages of the pipeline with Rosa, um, the Arter, the Quinn, uh, the senior project, or the conversion of the Crown Plaza, and then the next uh, phase of Bloomington Central Station, and, and hopefully with a grocery store in one of these projects, something that we're working on. So um, what we're here tonight is to um, ask the council and port authority to approve a change to the legislative policy so that we can look at financing tools during this session that's happening right now um, to support projects that drive um, hotel rooms and retail to continue to um, help that um, sector both recover and be successful into the future it's an important part 
of our economy. Um, the session is happening right now. And the project specifics would come later. We're not here selling one particular project tonight or another. Um, what we're doing is looking for funding flexibility for existing dollars, um, not new money from any particular source. So we protected those TIF dollars in 2020. Now is the time that we want to um, look for different ways to use those TIF dollars so that we can build projects that drive the hospitality industry. And I think I'll pause there briefly if there's questions um, of me before I turn it over to the, to the mall folks and they have a presentation that they will walk through as well. Very good council. Any questions of Mr. Rudlang? I see council member Coulter with his hand up. Council member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Excuse me, Shane. Um, do we have a rough estimate? I, I think you said the average number of new hotel rooms that opened up per year for the last few years was like 157. Do we have a rough estimate of, of and I'm going to apologize right now if you all hear something coming from above me that is my two-year-old running around and having a good time. Um, do we have a rough idea of how many new hotel rooms we could expect this year? Um. Mayor and Councilmember Coulter, the um, only project that's under construction right now is the um, Hyatt House at the northeast corner of 86 and Old Chalk. Um, that's roughly 150 rooms. So, ironically, even during the pandemic, we might see, uh, well, we will see the opening of another hotel project. Um, and oddly, uh, there are rumors of other hotel projects in the pipeline. Um, which is surprising to me, I'll just speak for myself, but um, the industry hasn't gone completely cold. And so while there isn't anything that's uh, you know imminent or working its way through the entitlement process now, there is some rumors of some projects, which again is super surprising given that you know we're sitting at um, roughly 35% occupancy and 30% of revenue. Thank you. Do we have any Port Authority commissioners that would like to raise a question? Well, I don't see any hands and unless somebody tells me, I just would, would like to make a, a comment, Shane. I, I think your presentation was great. And for those of us that were around really since inception on this, one of the things that we hope for and, and your numbers don't uh, capture it in one sense is we knew that the city was going to be foregoing the, the, the property taxes, et cetera, because of the tax increment and they would be used to, to pay these things down. But what we hoped is, is that the value of the surrounding properties would increase. And I haven't seen any exact studies, but I know we've talked about it before. And I think that that, that has more than happened. In other words, the, the properties that surround them all and Wilmington Central Station and that, increase substantially in value. So that's another big plus that we've had out of this whole process. It's, it's hard to quantify, but I think it's important for us to keep in mind. Yes, Mr. President and uh, commissioners, just anecdotally, uh, that's, that's definitely true. Um, I think there are some of our assessing staff that may be logged in, and, but, um, we can we can take a look at that and, and provide you with some information of what property values have done over time. But um, it's definitely the case, you know, with the advent of light rail, uh, the mall, everything else that's happened out there over the uh, past decades and whatnot. There's there's no doubt the property's gotten more valuable. Council, any additional questions? I do not see any hands waving. So I would say uh, we move on. Thank you, Mayor um, and President, uh, uh, Council Members and Commissioners. So at this point, we'll turn it over to Kurt Hagen and Jill Renslow with Mall of America. I'll let them introduce themselves for those that may not that may not know them. Um, they're going to walk through a, a presentation of um, things that have been happening um, at the mall and uh, to Triple Five generally during the pandemic. Well, good evening, Mr. Hagan. Good to see you again. 
I believe you may be on mute, Kurt. We're still not hearing. Carolyn? Carolyn, did you unlock us? We'll just have to take ourselves off mute. Yes, we Kurt. Can you, we can hear you now, Kurt. Uh, we can hear you now, Kurt. Can you hear us now? There we go. Yes. Yay. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> a little bit of a panic, so we're good to go. Thank you, Shane, and good evening, Mayor Bussey, Port President Erickson, Council Members, and Port Commissioners. We appreciate the opportunity to present to you this evening. I'm Jill Renzva, I'm the Executive Vice President of Business Development for Mall of America, and Kurt Hagen with me this evening, the SVP of Development for Triple Five. So thank you for taking the time with us this evening. For nearly three decades, Mall of America has been a Minnesota landmark and a significant economic engine. Pre-COVID, historically, we would have welcomed more than 40 million annual visits, featured more than 520 retail and dining tenants, hosted more than 400 free events every year, ranging from top-line celebrity performances to family-friendly events like Toddler Tuesdays, reinvest in the experience-driving Nickelodeon universe with 27 rides, and expand to just over 5.6 million square feet. Among our newer additions, Radisson Blue, JW Marriott, offices at MOA, and our beautiful north entrance. Whenever we want to make sure we're on track, we always go back to the why. In other words, we look at our core values, why we do what we do. We've been very good at offering the very best in retail, dining, attractions, and, and all since we have first opened, but we continue to make these three areas even better for our guests. With great pride and a sense of tremendous responsibility, we understand that Mall of America is often the first or primary experience for guests from around the world. In a sense, the image of Bloomington and the entire state of Minnesota rests on our shoulders, and we wouldn't have it any other way. If we simply meet the expectations of our guests, we have failed. At our core, our goal is to exceed expectations and deliver unexpected delights that will stay with our guests. Remaining flexible and thinking creatively went into overdrive this past year. From reopening the mall and Nickelodeon Universe with industry leading safety standards to creating a new live stream shopping platform to even pivoting to an entirely online Santa experience with our Candy Cane Institute, our team never lost a step. Finally, we thrive on creating memories that will last a lifetime for all of our guests. It's what makes them happy and what brings us all joy. Mall of America has modeled a strong corporate social responsibility since before it opened in 1992. We have continued to grow our community support by hosting more than 30 nonprofit events every year, helping to raise more than $16 million annually. In fact, our longest running nonprofit partner, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, hosted its first local JDRF walk at Mall of America before we opened, and we've held it every year since although last year it was virtual. We have many programs to promote health and wellness at Mall of America, and most are free to the public. Just last Friday, we opened the Community Vaccination Program site on Level 2 Southeast Court, one of four in the state of Minnesota. This past weekend, over 6,000 educators and child care providers were vaccinated, and another 8,000 this week, along with the ability to grow and serve tens of thousands in the coming weeks and months. Since 1992, we've hosted the Mall Stars Mall Walking Program with hundreds of walkers, many of whom are seniors, getting their exercise and social time in a safe, weather-friendly environment. And we host hundreds of school groups and programs such as Big Brothers and Big Sisters to programs such as our annual Ladybug release in Nickelodeon Universe. Of course, all the coins tossed in our fountains are donated to different nonprofit partners each month, paying thousands of dollars each year. Mall of America was green before the term even became popular. With a partnership with the City of Bloomington and Excel Energy, together we had the largest ever LED conversion project with all the lights in our two parking ramps, saving enough energy to power Nickelodeon Universe for an entire year. We recycled 65% of our waste, including sending restaurant food waste to a local pig farmer and working with a local company to transform the waste from fire oil to biodiesel fuel. We have long worked hard to create a welcoming environment for everyone, but over the course of the past few years, we have built a designated program and an internal team of champions to foster the goals 
of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Our workforce is very diverse, both among Mall of America team members and those of our tenants, but we realized we needed to be more intentional about giving all team members the opportunity to grow and succeed at the Mall. We offer internal programs, support systems, and educational offerings to our team to help them share in the shaping of our DIB program. We have worked closely with the community to create opportunities like Community Commons, where we've provided free rent for six months for 15 local businesses impacted by the community unrest last spring. We just announced this morning that seven of those businesses are moving on to their own retail space here at Mall of America, opening room for more local minority-owned businesses to have exposure in our unique property. We also supported the Minnesota Transitions Charter School, also impacted by the destruction, and every meal to provide much needed food for local families, all to help our community grow stronger. Much has happened over the last year, impacting our country, our state, our local community, and here at Mall of America. I'd like to provide you a glimpse into the operations at MOA. When the first news of COVID-19 began to emerge in early 2020, the MOA team quickly began developing new safety protocols to offer a safe environment. Many were implemented prior to our initial shutdown in March. While we remained closed from March 18th to June 10th, the greatly reduced MOA team developed an extensive safety plan that included education, signage, plexiglass barriers, hand sanitizers, and so much to prepare to welcome guests back to Mall of America. During this time, we forged a unique partnership with Graco and their newly developed Santa sprayer. In fact, we received the first 40 prototype units that came off their assembly line. Two great Minnesota companies working together and innovating at this challenging time. During the shutdown, once we reopened and continuing to this day, we track safety data with our guests, our tenants and employees. Our goal is to continue to move the needle to, even more, to make even more people more comfortable and safe here at MOA. One of the hardest changes we needed to make was the reduction in our workforce. Prior to COVID, 848 individuals were employed by Mall of America. When we closed the mall in March, we furloughed 90% of our team members, retaining a very small crisis transition team until the property reopened. Based on the business needs, we have brought back team members, but the overall impacts have resulted to having to permanently lay off 30% of our workforce across all departments. As you can see from this chart showing pre-COVID numbers in blue and current staffing in orange. Providing a variety of job opportunities gives us great pride at Mall of America. The diversity of our team is celebrated and recognized across the Twin Cities community, including over 14% of our employees from right here in the Bloomington community. Also recognize the strong numbers from Minneapolis and St. Paul, much due to the ease of transportation via transit. A transit has been a unique asset to Mall of America and Bloomington, but recently causing many challenges for security. Security is critical to the safety at Mall of America, both in implementation of additional protocols brought by COVID, but also managing and mitigating crime. We have witnessed increase in crime compared to our traffic, and it's critical to have our partnership with Bloomington Police. With traffic down nearly 50%, Security calls have only been down 11 to 15%. That includes assaults, trespasses, disorderly conducts, and disturbances. We have seen an increase in transient issues since reopening with things like loitering, drug use, overdoses, sleeping, and disturbances. Due to that increase in transient issues, the transit center is now locked from 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. And the pedestrian bridge across Killebrew is locked from midnight to 5 a.m. daily. We've also seen an increase in suspects carrying weapons, primarily knives, but also pepper spray and stun guns. Compared to pre-COVID, there seems to be this general don't care attitude amongst some of our visitors, many because they know the consequences are minimal. What is important to note that this is not a Mall of America issue. Crime is all around us and it's up and we are no exception. Security aside, the good news is performance is slowly improving and there is light at the end of the tunnel. Government restrictions have had significant impacts on our business and still do, especially with restaurants and attractions. Traffic continues to remain steady with a slight growth. In quarter four of 2020, we were consistently around 50% in comparison to 2019. 
Fortunately, we've made some progress in February, seeing the best month-over-month -month traffic count since reopening. Last month, we tracked closer to 40% down year over year, and this past week was the best traffic since the holiday season, and Saturday alone had the highest traffic car count since reopening. All good news. Holiday and cold weather continue to drive strong traffic, and with pent-up demand for our offering, we are expecting a strong, excuse me, strong traffic over spring break. Providing a look at this past year, you'll see a direct correlation with our traffic and sales to the milestone dates of the pandemic and government shutdown. The first drastic plunge that you see on this chart comes on March 18th, when Mall of America temporarily closes due to the pandemic. An incline can be noted around June 10th, when MOA partially reopens retail, dining, and some attractions with limited capacity. Another incline is noted at August 11th, when Nickelodeon Universe reopened at a limited capacity of 250 guests. On November 21st, we received the unfortunate announcement to close attractions and indoor dining, which significantly impacted our holiday season. And then on January 11th, attractions and indoor dining reopened. Nickelodeon Universe capacity now limited to 150, then increased to 250 on February 13th. On this next slide, you'll see an added pink line that indicates the hospitality um, traffic and trend from the Bloomington industry. As Shane noted, the tourism industry will take years to recover. We are optimistic it will recover based on historical behavior. We note that the leisure market will bounce back faster than the business travel market with a projected recovery in 2022, whereas the business traveler will be more likely to, to rebound in 2024. Another interesting comparison is the performance of our sister property at West Edmonton Mall in Alberta, Canada. Their sales and traffic have been better than MOA on a month-to-month -month basis, but they did have a sales drop in December due to the recent government attraction closures that they've recently experienced. Given the reduced traffic and sales, revenues have been impacted because many tenants are simply unable to pay rent. Total revenues were down over 30%. Compare that to the city's revenues that were only down approximately 4% over 2019, and you can imagine the challenges that creates. We expected 21 to be very similar to 2020 in terms of revenues given the ongoing pandemic impact and government restrictions. But revenue recovery is expected to begin in 2022 and will take several, several years. As for capital expenditures, we will invest in necessary, as necessary to protect our assets and our essentials. This includes projects like roof replacement, parking decks and asphalt rehabs, vertical transportation, mechanical needs, ride rehabs, service initiatives, and tenant improvements. But at this time, we are not focused on projects that are nice to have, such as common area renovations, decor, and non-essential equipment. Shifting to leasing and partnerships. So leasing has been negatively impacted in, in the near term as tenants are opt opportunistic and nervous in this environment. We will be fine in the long run once we restore foot traffic as foot traffic drives sales, which in turn drives leasing. Tenants are taking advantage of the environment that we're in. We have lost approximately 45 tenants, mostly in the restaurant and attraction categories being hit the hardest. Most renewals and new leases are below market for the next couple of years, except for strong performers, such as Nike, Coach, Hugo Boss, and Burberry, who all recently extended their term. Many tenants are looking for percentage rent deals or deals with reduced rent for the next couple of years because of the, all the unknowns and the trend for shorter terms with kickouts based on sales thresholds and traffic. Tenants want to be at Mall of America and 90% of the retail shops are open and they will pay market rent if we have the traffic to bring to them. They know they're not going any, we're not going anywhere long term, even in a pandemic. Mall of America consistently trends in the top three in terms of traffic in all U.S. shopping centers. Sales are looking better for many of our tenants, even having their best months ever since June 2020 with the mall reopening, such as Nike, Foot Locker, Burberry, UGG, Bath & Body Works, Vails, Peloton, Coach, Armani, and the list goes on. What's great to say is we have great leasing activity, including tenants who have opened during the pandemic who are under construction or are currently finalizing lease terms. 
New deals now happening include Capital One Cafe, which is under construction, Warby Parker, Therabody, Fabletics just tripled their size and are under construction for a flagship location right outside of Nordstrom. We also have unique retail stores like Community Commons, Paisley Park, and Fair and Four, all local operators. We're very excited about our new M&M World Retail Attraction, which is one of seven in the world of the likes of New York, Vegas, London, Shanghai, Berlin, Orlando, and coming soon to Bloomington. We also recognize consumer shopping behaviors have changed, and it's important for us to evolve as a property and provide tools to our retailers to offer new services from curbside pickup, live stream shopping, and buy online pickup and store. These changes are here to stay, and it's important for us to connect with consumers where it's convenient for them, yet delivering an amazing Mall of America experience. A testament to our brand and our strong partnership relationships have been able to maintain most of our sponsors. Each of our tours and partners have been severely hurt financially, but not only they do they value the Mall of America partnership as a priority in 2020, they also renewed their partnerships in 2021, recognizing the importance of MOA and our partnership in marketing efforts. In 2020, Mall of America had 25 hotel partners and were able to renew 21 existing and one new hotel in 2021. Also, all of Mall of America's multi-year partners paid in full contractual amounts in their partnership for 2020. They truly recognize the value and believe in our long-term success. The final section I'd like to talk about is tourism and attractions. These are key differentiators for our property. Traditionally, tourists have made up about 40% of our traffic, yet 50% of our sales, and that was effectively shut down in March of 2020. But there are hopeful signs of hope to return, although they are small, incremental, anecdotal, and full recovery is likely to take years. With increasing vaccination rates and decreasing hospitalization, consumers will gradually feel more confident to travel. Even since the holiday season, we have noted that a small portion of our guests are traveling from other cities. We know this because they are often not aware of our safety protocols or limited attraction numbers, and they let us know where they've been traveling from. As Bloomington hotel numbers slowly begin to climb, we're hopeful that we will indicate a bit stronger spring break that we might be able to be experienced. President's Day weekend and this past weekend both showed strong traffic numbers at the mall. And since many families aren't comfortable flying or traveling to places like Mexico or other destinations, we're hopeful that the drive market will continue to pick up. Currently, we have a staycation spring break promotion featuring 17 of the Bloomington Hotel partners, encouraging visitors from our drive markets to visit Mall of America and Bloomington for their spring break getaways, starting this weekend and running through mid-April. We continue to work closely with the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau, explore Minnesota tourism, meet Minneapolis, and visit St. Paul, among others, to drive traffic, primarily the drive market, to Minnesota and Mall of America. We also work closely to align with the U.S. Travel Associ Association, many chambers, and other organizations to help with the interest in travel and destinations. Recently introduced, um, Congress recently introduced a bipartisan bill called the Hospitality and Commerce Job Recovery Act of 2021. It shows promise for the travel and tourism industry. Some of the measures in that bill include a temporary business tax credit to revitalize business meetings, conferences, and structured events, restores the entertainment business expense deduction to help entertainment venues and performing arts centers revive, an individual tax credit to stimulate non-business travel, and finally, tax relief for restaurants and food and beverage companies to help restore food, job, food service jobs. MOA is so much more than a mall. We are an entertainment destination, and our attractions differentiate us and are a significant driver for our overall traffic. The government imposed mandates that have closed or limited capacity have severely impacted our attractions. But once listed, lifted, our attractions will do well. We are currently limited to 250 people in Nickelodeon Universe at one time. And as a result, our revenues are down over 40, 70%. We have been working with the state to loosen the capacity restrictions prior to spring break, which would allow for a better year. But despite weekly meetings with DEED and MDH and state leaders, try to find a path to loosen those restrictions, but the dial has yet to be turned for large venues. 
The graphic shows the capacity comparison to show the, that retail is able to open at 100%, yet attractions still have a one-size-fits-all restriction, no matter the size, with 25% up to 250 guests. This restriction is the same whether it's a bowling alley, Chuck E. Cheese, or one of our attractions such as Sea Life or Crayola, or even our seven-acre theme park, which you can see is a small capacity on the Nick Universe graph. It's actually only 3% of our overall capacity, and it's the bar second to the left next to the, the pink tower that's representing the mall common area. Nickelodeon is maxing capacity on the weekends right after we open and then we experience a consistent four hour wait for families to enter the park. Weekdays prior to spring break, we're seeing about six to 800 guests in Nickelodeon Universe. If any of you have visited the park in the past few months, you probably feel like you've had the entire park to yourself. We have plenty of room for more guests to come enjoy with us. Our hope is to see an increase in the large venue attractions in the near future in hopes to have 750 in capacity. And lastly, the slide before I hand it over to Kurt is a comparison to our sister property in New Jersey. Their attractions continue to do well with both traffic and revenue growth despite the November and December COVID spike. Not a good barometer because of the pandemic since retail has never fully opened at American Dream. But what I wanna call out is that attractions are doing well despite the restrictions, the lack of tourism and retail support. Even though state mandates have closed and went through effective three, the, sorry, the state mandates went in effect three days before the retail center was to open, retail capacities and attraction restrictions, the attractions are the bright spot between the amusement park, the water park, the ski hill, the ice rink, mini golf, they're all open at 25% capacity and are doing well under the circumstances. Attractions are key. And it over to Kurt. Thank you, Jill. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Port President, Council Members, and, and uh, Port Commissioners. Appreciate the time you're giving us tonight to give you this background on how we're doing at Mall of America and also Triple Five as a whole. Um, Shane had asked me if I would kind of give an overview of the Triple Five Worldwide Group, kind of the, the company itself and, and what makes us up. So I, I created a, a very simplistic graph that I think makes sense. I, I know our, our accountants and attorneys would probably cringe if they saw this in, in the reporting structure, but just to kind of walk you through what makes up the bulk of Triple Five, I know you're all familiar with the, the three you know, largest um, shopping and entertainment developments in North America and West Edmonton Mall, Mall of America and American Dream. What you're probably not as familiar with is Triple Five group of companies, which is really a cluster of many different companies, most of them small, uh, a couple of them fairly significant that all feed up into the group of companies that also feed up in Triple Five worldwide. So some examples, you know, we, as you, I, I think you're aware, we have two hotels up in our um, Canadian property in, at West Edmonton. Uh, we've got an industrial engineering firm down in Texas with I think three locations. We've got an industrial manufacturing firm that makes a big electrical switch gear um, two very small uh, oil and gas companies, two banks, one that's fairly substantial, one that's very small, um, still have several real estate holdings down in Las Vegas, a couple of strip malls and some industrial properties, and um, a couple in Arizona as well. So there's just a cluster of these other companies that all feed up, all of these providing cash flow up to World Triple uh, Five worldwide. Uh, we want to cover a little bit about the uh, pandemic impacts on Triple Five and on the shopping center industry. Uh, it's you know been it's no surprise to any of you that the shopping center developers have been extremely hard hit by the pandemic, and Triple Five was no exception. Unlike our competitors, though, we believe that our projects, being entertainment focused, will come out of this faster than other shopping center developments because we do think entertainment will lead this recovery. What's important to note though is that the cash flow issues that Triple Five experienced um, were created by this pandemic, not by a broken or outdated business model. We believe strongly in the impacts of the vaccine and what that will have on consumer confidence and we believe that will lead guests back to Mall of America. We're just starting to see that now. We think that's gonna continue through the rest of this year and into next year. The COVID-19, the governmental assistance 
Um, unlike most businesses and industries and municipalities, a Mold American American Dream did not qualify for any federal, state, or county assistance programs. Triple Five has borne all the costs associated with the COVID-19 impacts and the government closures, which will likely be in the hundreds of millions of dollars by the time this is all done. Over the past year, there's been a lot of talk from the federal government and the state um, as in terms of relief, but so far it hasn't advanced beyond that. We're still very hopeful that some of these discussions will actually turn into real relief um, with either the federal government or state or both. We agree with Governor Walz, who has spoken repeatedly about how the government needs to help those it asked to close for the sake of public health. Um, the governor has also repeatedly said that the state has a moral responsibility to help those that it is asked to close. And um, we're, we look forward to actually working with the governor and the state and try to figure out what that looks like uh, at this legislative session. And we believe what staff is bringing forward tonight, loosening the restrictions temporarily on TIF could be a way that the state could actually help us. With the regards to the Mall of America mortgage update, I know as most of you are aware, our mortgage um, was successfully restructured last November. And we're very thankful that our lenders have been uh, very cooperative throughout that process and have taken a partnership approach in helping us solve the cash flow, impact, uh, cash flow impacts created by COVID-19. Um, our lenders understand that the crisis was caused by a pandemic, not by triple five. And they understand that their investment returns are linked to our successful recovery and they're working with us to help us succeed. West Edmonton Mall, unlike our, our situation in Mall of America and American Dream, um, West Edmonton did qualify for government assistance in, in Canada. And because of that support, they avoided, uh, avoided the cash flow crisis and, that we saw in the US and no loan modifications were required in West Edmonton. American Dream, um, was the opposite end of that. As Jill mentioned, uh, the timing couldn't have been worse uh, in terms of the, the pandemic. Um, we were finally able to reopen our entertainment and launch our retail on October 1st, which was seven months after it was closed by the government orders due to the pandemic, which was, as Jill mentioned, just three days before the retail was slated to open last March. Um, the, Project opened under capacity restrictions across the board of 25%. That was consistent throughout that seven months up till about two or three weeks ago. Um, they've now moved it to 35%, but it's still operating under a very heavily restricted environment, which makes it very difficult on retail. Many of our retails that were ready to open last March still have not opened. Don't, they don't wanna open and they won't until those restrictions are lifted because they just would lose money every day at those capacity restrictions. Um, also, as Jill mentioned, the, 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 the attractions are really the bright spot. Um, every single one of our attractions has seen some pretty strong month over month gains in uh, revenues and, um, and, and attendance has kind of flattened out because of that restriction. It's bumping up now again with the, the um, restrictions going to 35%, but the revenue growth uh, has been very strong. Uh, over the past year, we've been working closely with our lending partners at American Dream to really chart a path through these difficult times. Obviously, this created a very significant cash flow crisis at American Dream as well. Not opening and be able to generate any cash for six months created some, some very significant problems. Those problems likely will lead to uh, the American Dream lenders um, securing their pledge. They had a minority pledge in Mall of America and West Edmonton Mall. That hasn't happened yet, but, but it's likely to happen. And uh, what that means, uh, if and when that does happen, uh, I'll remind, I think, what we covered um, a year ago when the, when the pledge was made, that this collateral pledge, it's, it's an indirect 49% interest in an ownership entity of Mall of America. There's no assets or mall property that was pledged. It simply means that um, once we return to profitability, 49% of those profits would go to the American Dream lenders until such time as that collateral is released. There'd be no impact on Mall of America or its operations. Lenders would have a non-controlling interest and quite frankly, they have no interest in running a shopping mall. Um, they're very confident in Triple Five's ability to do so. And the pledge is only against the mall phase one property. It does not extend to phase two or even 
um, the hotels or phase 1C. It's important to note is that that pledge was structured um, in such a manner that 555 would never lose controlling interest in Mall of America under the worst case scenario, which we've now seen. Quite frankly, from a financial perspective, um, it would have been much better if Mall of America or the American Dream would have burned down or a hurricane had hit it financially, because we would have been covered by insurance. But uh, this pandemic that we didn't see coming has not been covered and is the worst scenario um, imaginable. The traffic and tourism that Jill started talking about and, and Shane did as well, I created a, a graph that I want to walk you through. I apologize. It's kind of, uh, there's a lot of information here, but I think it's very important and I think it'll help you realize um, the connection between the city general funds and the mall traffic that Shane talked a, bit, a little bit about in his presentation, but I want to um, kind of highlight some of that. And, and it really starts with the attractions, right? the attractions at Mall of America and our 400 events a year that we typically have and the retail in the office that, that drive to what is in a typical year, 40 million visitors at Mall of America. That flow then goes to mall sales and really drives our mall sales and our attractions attendance, which in turn drives our normal revenue, our rent revenue and our attractions revenue, which feeds into the mall's net operating income or profits, which determines it's the primary indicator of the mall's property tax each year, or its evaluation is, is driven by that NOI, which drives the property tax, which goes into the city's general fund in addition to the admissions taxes that flow right from our sales um, into the city's general fund. Likewise, that traffic drives the hospitality community or helps drive the, the very healthy up till this year hospitality community uh, in Bloomington. So it drives room nights. Those 40% uh, of our guests that are tourists are staying in hotels, eating in restaurants and, 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 and bars in the community. That in turn drives the net operating income of the hotels and the restaurants, which, which manifests itself into its property values, which again flows into property tax and into the city's general fund, in addition to the lodging taxes that they create that also go into the city's general fund. General fund is obviously how you fund your strategic priorities, police, all of the, the various city services that you provide. What's important to note is that this traffic, these two industries generate about almost a quarter of the city's revenues each year pre-COVID. Um, so it's a very significant connection between this traffic and the city's general fund. What happens when this, uh, this uh, ecosystem is disrupted, if you will, uh, that we saw this year in the pandemic, the, all of the attractions effectively have been closed for a year. Yes, we have 150 or 250 people in a, in a seven acre uh, amusement park, but for all essential purposes, the attractions have been closed since last March. Of the 350 to 400 events a year, they've almost entirely been canceled. Retail has been impacted, as you know, our office building that Jill and I are in now, there's maybe 30 or 40 people in our entire office building any given day. So that, that has taken our 40 million visitors down, cut it roughly in half. To 20 million, which obviously flows through to the mall sales and our tenants, they're unable, many of them, to pay rent, which um, impacts our NOI. That will impact the property tax valuation that will eventually hit the city's general fund. There's a lag, obviously, in these property tax values of almost, a, almost two years in this case, because the values, the property tax being paid this year were set January of last year, which was pre-pandemic. So while the city has seen kind of an immediate impact of the admissions and lodging tax, um, it's yet to see the impacts of the property taxes and how that's gonna flow or impact the, the city's general fund. Obviously that's a very complicated formula and, and um, we'll save that discussion for another day. Um, but what's uh, not calculated really in that 24% of revenues is kind of the other impacts that Mall of America and the hospitality community have on Bloomington, which is obviously jobs creation, um, your number one and number two industries in Bloomington would be at Mall of America and Hospitality. The liquor lodging taxes that go to South Loop Development Fund. So the liquor taxes, none of that flows to the city's general fund, goes directly to the South Loop Development Fund, as does um, a portion of the lodging taxes. 
that are generated. I think this is to the tune of something around $7 million a year. Spin-off developments that have happened in Bloomington Central Station around the mall, infrastructure, um, the light rail uh, station that would not be here but for the mall. And then obviously there's suppliers and vendors and consultants that we use each and every day that supply um, products to Mall of America, signage to Mall of America, um, all of the service, not only ourselves, but all, to all of our tenants. So we really just wanted to highlight that connection um, of it all for us all goes back to traffic and tourism. How do we work together to really drive that traffic and tourism to support these two industries in Bloomington, which in turn uh, will help the city. So to that end, I'll turn it back to Shane. I just would ask for your support in, in staff's recommendation to allow them to go seek a tool that could be used to, to expand TIF to be used to drive product or, or projects really in this category that again would, would flow to the traffic and tourism that feeds Mall of America and the hospitality community. So we look forward to, to working with staff as to what those projects would be. Um, and with that, Shane, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Kurt and Jill. Um, I know that was a lot of information for for us all to consume, and I think uh, now would be an appropriate time if the council and Port Authority have questions on that. Um, now would be a good time to bring that bring those questions forward. Well, Shane, I just like to to jump in before we get into the questions and that, and say how much I appreciate the the, the very professional way that you and Kurt have navigated over this last year. It's it's been a lot of difficult issues, never easy, but I know we, we have been talking frequently and, and you are reporting back to me. And so I just want to thank both of you for your professionalism and dealing with these tough issues because we're dealing with unknown things. And, and again, I, I just would like to, to emphasize again, having been with this thing since the inception, that it's something that has been a, a partnership that has worked. We've had disagreements uh, and that's to be expected because we're two different parties and, and things. but. At the same point in time, it has been a, a wonderful benefit to the, the city. So with that, I'll turn it over and, and uh, we can open it up for questions. But I just think it's so important to recognize how much communication, how much things have gone on and, and, and that the two of you primarily are the ones that are talking sometimes daily, certainly every week. And uh, it, it's, it's been something that's been, I think, a big benefit of the city and to the mall. Mr. President? Yes, Commissioner Hunt. I, just, I would just like to re reiterate that. I, you, you know, you and I have both been involved with this for um, several decades, and it's it's really good to see the discussion points and differences in the past, um, some not so pleasant. Um, and this is obviously very difficult times, but the professionalism, again, is, as you both exemplified, and, and the discussions between the parties have has been um, very good. Never easy discussions, but um, professionalism is, is always very apparent. Well, and I think it's also appropriate to, to thank our commissioners on that. I know that Commissioner Hunt, because of her knowledge of banking, has been a tremendous resource, and I think Commissioner Luntz and, and many other people. So again, this is something that as we've gone through this very difficult period, it's been wonderful that people have been willing to share their talents and knowledge. Thank you, President Erickson and Commissioner Hunt. Um, and um, again, uh, questions um, and discussion of the mall team. Thanks, thanks, Kurt and uh, Jill for, for all that information. Looks like we have a couple of questions from council members. Uh, I see Council Member Nelson and then Council Member Carter. Council Member Nelson? Yeah, um, I apologize if I'm jumping the gun here, but exactly what are we being asked? I don't understand what the question is. I think the question, Councilmember Nelson, what we're, what we're considering, what we want to talk about tonight, um, it, we, we would like to seek legislation to add flexibility to the existing TIF and or the liquor lodging statutes in order to support projects that deliver hospitality demand. And right now, uh, there's, 
there are there are definite restrictions on how TIF can be used. There are restrictions on our, our liquor and lodging statutes. Uh, what we would like to do is seek. Um, we we're asking the council and, and the port authority, directing staff to add the following provisions to the, the the legislative policy to try and loosen up provisions so we can use TIF in a little bit different way to basically help the hospitality industry. And I want to be clear that it isn't specifically for the Mall of America. Uh, I, I think the mall, obviously, being a leader in hospitality across the region, across the state, would be a, a, a leading voice on this. But I know that there is support uh, in the hospitality industry to look for tools to try and jumpstart the hospitality industry again. And that's what that's what we're looking at. That's what we're talking about tonight, whether or not we want to uh, uh, empower staff to move forward with uh, with, with uh, the the goal of trying to change uh, changing our legislative policy with the goal of trying to change legislation to allow a, a broader use of TIF. So it, I understand that um, kind of, but it, 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 to make it more concrete, like what specifically would we be paying for portions of projects that would normally be privately funded? Um, and um, I guess my, my other question is, where is the hospitality industry? Why aren't they here asking for this? I think the answer about specifics, I, I don't think we have specifics in mind about specific projects or exactly how this is all going to come together. I, I think this is a, a broad ask, very general ask about trying to, uh, to change the legislation uh, around TIF. Uh, I think th there was talk about doing it on a temporary basis, not necessarily a permanent change, but just as a, as a way of, uh, as I said, jumpstarting the hospitality industry. Why isn't hospitality in Minnesota here? I mean, that's a good question. Uh, this is being the, the Bloomington port and the Bloomington City Council and the Bloomington business. I, uh, I guess we're just working to take the lead on something like this. But uh, as I said, with, uh, with the, the need and the demand across the state and across the hospitality industry, I can about guarantee that others would, will jump on board on this with, with looking for opportunities. Mr. Mayor, um, Councilman Nelson, if I may. <clears throat> um, so yeah, t tonight all we're asking is the Port and Council to let us go talk to the legislature to, to see what tools um, we could uh, make available for projects that drive hospitality, whatever they may be. Again, we're not asking for funding for a specific project or anything like that. Ultimately, what we're asking for is the Council to change the legislative policies of the city so that we can go talk to the legislature with your consent. Um, Again, no specific projects, um, but we don't want to do that without your support. And so um, that's what we're asking for tonight. Um, the other main event, of course, is just to give you an update on the mall. You haven't heard from the mall um, during the pandemic formally. Um, there have been some informal updates and other information that's been passed to the board and council over the past year, but we thought it was a good opportunity to update the council and board on, on how the mall is doing. And, um, you know, obviously it's a huge piece of the city's finances and tax base and job base and everything else like that. Um, it's a good idea to, to communicate directly with the port and the community um, on a regular basis. Usually we're here in front of you on a much more regular basis um, with projects and these updates come along with the projects. But so twofold tonight, the update and then change the policy so that we can go with your support to talk to the legislature and see if there's ways to change rules on TIF so that we could invest more directly in projects to put some more concrete um, uh, ness to it, if you will. Um, TIF cannot be used directly in projects, and that's one of the tools that we are looking at that could help some of these projects get off the ground uh, to help the hospitality industry. As to where the hospitality industry is, Hospitality Minnesota certainly would be a partner. We're connected with them. Um, the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau, um, we've been talking to them a lot for the past couple of weeks, so they are fully engaged in this. Um, they're seeking their own legislation to help fund. Um, in fact, there's a bill that's moving um, for uh, tourism improvement districts, which is basically um, uh, hotel consented additional uh, lodging tax or a fee on a, on a per room night. So they're working on that. They're fully supportive of this, um, this push and anything else that we can do to help with hospitality demand. Uh, Shane, I, I think it's important just to interject that, that obviously 
what, what you're talking about doing is getting additional options. Whatever was going to be done obviously would have to be proposed and would have to be approved both by the, the, the council and, and the port in terms of, of actually any specific project. Uh, it's, it's just the, the kind of thing that I think looking at these things, if, if there's an opportunity to take and, and give additional flexibility to provide options, it's something that, that I think is beneficial and doesn't hurt. Councilmember Nelson, anything additional there? I guess, um, you know, it, 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 to, to be, I wasn't specifically talking about hospitality in Minnesota. I was talking about the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Oh. Um, it would be nice to actually hear from them on this and how they thought it could help. Um, I guess I'm a little confused as to why we're not being asked to support the legislation they're supporting. Um, I have deep concerns about um, directly uh, paying for private projects as opposed to paying for infrastructure. Um, I, you know, I, to be candid, this ask is extremely difficult to support. I saw Council Member Carter's hand go up and then uh, President Erickson, uh, Commissioner Peterson's hand went up and then I believe we've got Council Member Coulter and Martin also wishing to speak. So Thank trying you. to play traffic cop here a little bit. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I have a couple different questions. Um, so I saw the language in the original deck and then I just heard, I think the mayor say it again, um, that it would be um, changing how TIF can be used um, and so that it can be used for projects that deliver hospitality demand. But I, I'm just curious if you can give me, I guess it's probably similar to Council Member Nelson's question, but some concrete examples of what that could look like or how would we define that even? I'm just, it's not clear to me um, what that really means. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, I guess we'll go with uh, Council Member Carter tonight instead of Port Authority Commissioner Carter. So um, a, a concrete example of this. So um, pre-pandemic, the city and Port Authority have been looking at a number of different options at the staff level and some that have you know risen to the council and port level. Um, the one that's uh, got the furthest is the water park, but others that we were looking at are the um, Center for Inspiration, the Space Shuttle Project, and also the other the other one that we continue to look at is you know some sort of multi-use facility. <clears throat> so think basketball tournaments, volleyball tournaments, potentially a shoe device, concerts, esports, things like that. Um, there's been a number of groups that have been um, looking around for a site to do those types of things for a number of years. I think there's at least three separate groups that, that we've met with that um, want to do something like that. It's something that um, we've been in discussions with our Convention and Visitors Bureau for a number of years as they go around and, and see these facilities and other locales. And um, there's probably no better spot in the metro to build some um, you know, medium-sized multi-use facility than out in South Loop, um, you know, next to or close to or attached even to Mall of America. And so how would you fund something like that? Those facilities don't make money on their own. They drive a lot of hospitality business, but they, they don't make money. And so they are unable to pay for their debt service, and sometimes they're not able to pay for their operations. So an example, again, this is um, we're not uh, trying to propose this. This isn't for consideration tonight. But an example of that would be to use TIF to either pay for some of those capital costs or backstop um, some of those capital costs for that project. Um, and so that, that's not currently allowed through the TIF statute. Um, that's a project that drives hospitality demand um, that currently probably isn't fundable today, um, even before the pandemic, um, without a lot of government assistance. And um, the, sh the space shuttle project is another one. Um, and who would own and operate those? Those would very likely be operated by some sort of nonprofit um, with the event center. Um, it could be a slate of options. Um, it could be an option that's uh, managed by the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau. It could be some other entity that's totally unrelated. It can be done a number of different ways. But um, to Councilmember Nelson's question, yeah, that's the ask is to use um, TIF to build that infrastructure um, directly in the building and not where it is allowed today for the parking for that, that type of structure. 
so if we were to um, approve this tonight and you went and had conversations with legislators and the governor's office, um, what additional decision points would we have as a council? I mean, I assume if there was specific legislation or um, something concrete, because I'm kind of hearing different things right now. Like I heard the mayor say, you know, um, you know, some something about, you know, the projects that deliver hospitality demand and changing TIF, but then I heard you say we're looking for tools. And so I guess I'm just, um, I'm wondering, you know, as things become a little bit more concrete, at what points will the decision or the, the council be weighing in, the Port Authority be weighing in on what that actually looks like? So Mayor and Councilmember Carter, as it relates to the legislation, um, the legislation, the sessions move very quickly and amendments happen, you know, quickly. And so scheduling council and Port Authority meetings for the nuances of legislation is typically isn't feasible. Um, so decision points along the way during the session are, are are not what we're envisioning at this point. You can direct us otherwise if you like, of course. Um, but on the projects themselves, of course, um, you know, again, just on the water park, I think we had seven or eight meeting checkpoints along the way. And um, again, this legislation isn't about the water park, but um, just as an example of a project um, that kind of ran that path, there was, again, you guys, um, approved certain expenditures along the way for that project um, and hadn't approved the project construction or anything like that. And so there you know, would have been maybe eight or nine different updates or meetings or decision points along the way before some big project actually gets built. And so at this point, um, again, this, these are projects um, that would drive hospitality demand. And we're just looking for the tools, the authority from you to go talk to the legislature to get the tools to be able to deliver these types of projects and um, the actual projects then are, are a whole different timeline of, of presentation and delivery and decision points by the council and port authority. Um, so I appreciate that um, that explanation and transparency. I do have uh, just a little bit of concerns with the timing of everything, considering uh, the federal government and the state government are all having conversations around how to provide relief to the hospitality industry. And I just wouldn't, you know, where I'm at right now is I don't know how far ahead I want to get of those conversations and those decisions. Um, as was mentioned, I mean, obviously, I completely understand the interconnectedness um, and the symbiotic relationship that we have um, with the mall, with the hospitality industry. Um, but as was mentioned, it really is a regional and state asset. Um, and so, and I, I know this is not a, like a mall supporting project. I know it's the, the whole area. Um, I just, I, I fear that, um, and maybe you can ease these fears, um, Shane, that there will be, I, I mean, that, I guess that there will be ripple effects that would then, um, you know, lead to other kinds of projects across the city or in South Loop not being funded and like housing projects or other things that we're looking at. Um, and it just feels like this is something that the state um, should be helping with, not just Bloomington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Member Carter. So, um, in that example that I laid out, um, you know, for the event center, just because that's an easy one to talk about. Um, I don't know that it would affect funding for other projects um, because in that example, it would be TIF that's um, tied up in the mall development contract. Um, so I, I guess you could envision a, situ a scenario where it would affect uh, the funding for other projects if you decided to fund or use funding from the South Loop Fund, for example, instead of um, funding a project over at Bloomington Central Station that has affordable housing in it, for example. Um, if you decide to shift resources around, you could imagine a scenario where, you know, should this legislation pass. But the, the next um, step then, of course, is you get decisions later on as to whether or not you want to fund project X, Y, or Z. So this, this, isn't, the, this isn't the meeting where you decide um, where you're going to spend the money. It's the meeting where you decide 
that you want to direct the staff to go and find the tools. Um, and so you, you get to have that decision later. But um, okay. your point is 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 well made. I mean, um, and I, in, in all honesty, that this this will be controversial if we do this. Um, there are people that are TIF purists, um, in particular at the Capitol, that um, you know don't want to do things like this. But in times of economic downturn, there have been a number of um, TIF flexibility, and that's why if the city council and port authority want to do this now would be the time to do it during this session um, during this downturn and um that's that's why we're proposing it for your consideration tonight uh, so i'll just ask one last question and i'll let my i'll let others and i'm i'm sorry i feel like i'm asking a lot um so is it staff recommendation that whatever tool gets developed um that it be temporary yeah, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Carter, that, that's what we're thinking right now, that it would be temporary, but th this would not be a Bloomington only thing. You know, there's lots of TIF districts around the state. There's lots of hospitality demand. And, um, you know, this, this certainly would not be Bloomington legislation. So we can't control, you know, we certainly can't control everything that happens in St. Paul. Um, but that's what we're thinking is a temporary um, use of this during the pan, you know, the time period around the pandemic for a couple of years. To deliver a project or two um but again you know there's no guarantees of what will come out of um the end of the session or if there will even be a tax bill this year i mean we don't know the answer to that but um yeah mr mayor mr Verbrugge. thank you uh council members and uh, board commissioners i just want to re-emphasize what what shane said in terms of what the ask is here and the, the, the adjustment of the legislative policy is really giving us the latitude to go and uh, uh, pursue, uh, expand. It's, it's really expanding the universe of possibilities for how we can apply TIF. And so the discretion, like Shane said, is always going to be with the court and the council uh, on, on which projects are uh, going to be uh, agreed to for partnership. Uh, all this is doing is expanding the possibilities for what those projects might be. And so as we look to figure out how we can best support ongoing development in the Mall of America that uh, in the South Loop area that is going to continue to um, support the, the economic foundation of the community. I think that one of the principles we've long had here is that the the universe of possibilities for opportunities should be expanded for local control and that we have more flexibility uh, to put together um, projects that are in our um, in our best interest economically and for the community. So like I said, you're always going to have the opportunity uh, to approve or, or reject any deal or proposal that comes your way. This is just giving us a lot more uh, of of, uh, of a spectrum to work with on those possibilities. I believe Commissioner Peterson was next in the queue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to echo what some of the other folks have said. I think this is this is the kind of uh, approval that a conversation is a good thing. Um, I can I can think of great outcomes of other conversations and I can think of things that we wouldn't want. And so I wanna make sure that <clears throat> as we're going through this, we're coming back and having conversations with the, the both the council and the port on kind of what's being discussed and how it works. Um, I think the other thing that we need to make sure that we're focusing on is uh, not just kind of people who are typically at the table on these sorts of things, which are kind of the larger development community and, and the hotel industry, but also be thinking about the things that we ought to be doing kind of as stand-ins for the smaller businesses in the community with respect to kind of getting things rebooted. And so I want to make sure that we're we're representing that kind of full range of business as we have these conversations in the hospitality industry. Because there's lots of hospitality businesses that are that are small that are that are not going to be at the table having the conversation. And I want to make sure we're thinking about them. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, Commissioner uh, Peterson. So um, one of the other agenda items that we were planning to do or tentatively planning to do tonight was an update on the work that the Port Authority had asked us to look at um, to develop 
some more um, programs and a range of options for small business development and retention. Um, and as we talked about it internally, it was it really had morphed into we want to make sure that we don't want um, that we don't neglect our big businesses either. So you know, tentatively we're calling it small and all businesses because we've got a lot of big businesses in Bloomington that are thriving and that we want to continue to um, uh, to make sure that they can they stay that way. And so um, in the very near future, we'll be uh, providing you uh, with an update on that work, um, probably at the April Port Authority meeting. And um, just wanted to give you that update there. Um, and also, I, I did want to follow up on uh, Commissioner Carter or Councilmember Carter's other question, which I neglected to answer earlier, which was related to, you know, it, shouldn't the state or the federal government be the ones that help um, these industries out? And I think, um, you know, the mall might actually be the better person to answer that question, but I'll give you my two cents on that. And, you know, we watched the federal legislation pretty closely. And um, while the, the $1.9 trillion, you know, second uh, COVID bill is working its way through uh, D.C. right now, there is some money in there for um, these types of industries, but it's it's fairly minor. Um, and then on the state side, I, I think the mall has asked and asked and asked, you know, the state to you know help out um, medium and large size large size businesses, and there's been very little movement there. Um, Kurt, I turned over to you if you wanted to add your work with um, with the state and fed, federal government. Yeah, you have to. Thank you, Shane and, and Mr. Mayor, Port President, Council, and Port members. We have. I mean, we've been. <laughs> <laughs> pounding the pavement, and um, we've had federal lobbyists, state lobbyists. We have spent a lot of time and money um, trying to pursue relief. It just hasn't happened. Uh, again, as I said in my presentation, it's a lot of talk and no action uh, to date. We hope that that will change, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. I don't want to I don't want to confuse it. This isn't about COVID relief. This is about how do we work together to build projects that drive traffic to tourism and to or to to mold America into the hospitality industry. How do we drive traffic and tourism? And it's not about COVID relief. It's not about diverting any TIF funds. Um, it's about giving the council and port flexibility in how they're used should they choose to at some future time for some future project. So um, again, I don't wanna confuse that with somehow this is tied into COVID relief for Mall of America, it has, has, it's not. Um, certainly it would help if we could figure out some projects to do together to drive traffic and tourism in our economic recovery, but that's, that's really not the ask here. The ask is, um, can you put a tool in your toolbox to help us look at projects in the future that may benefit Bloomington and the mall and the hospitality community? And if they do, great. If they don't, you don't use it. I see hands up uh, Council Member Martin, Coulter, and Beloga, and then Commissioner Lunds, I think, has had his hand up as well. So, Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you uh, very much, and, and thank you for all this information tonight. And Kirk I appreciate the update uh, on how the mall has has gotten through a pretty crazy year. Um, if, forgive me, this question is a little bit half baked. I, I guess I'm I'm trying to figure out. If this feels similar to a conversation, obviously, we had had a year and a half ago, two years ago now, um, talking about supporting the overall hospitality environment with a large attraction like say the water park. Um, and staff was very creative in putting together kind of the conduit financing and. Um, kind of ways to facilitate private investment in, in attractions like that. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm just curious now coming out of this, if, if it's the flexibility isn't for immediate COVID relief to bridge this gap until some of this traffic comes back. Um, is there something about market forces we're anticipating on the back end of this crisis once things have recovered uh, that we, we don't believe our level of hospitality will continue to be supported uh, or that we need additional flexibility to build projects uh, to continue boosting that demand? I'm just wondering, are we at an unsustainable level of hospitality industry uh, without what sound like some pretty substantial changes to the way we invest in projects or support projects? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilmember Martin. Um, yeah, so, you know, no, nothing we're talking about here is um, COVID relief specifically um, because projects take a long time to get built, right? 
I think more appropriately, what we're talking about is um, ensuring and trying to ensure the long-term viability of our hospitality industry as was demonstrated as a huge part of the city's financial ecosystem, uh, jobs ecosystem, et cetera. Um, we're thinking long-term, these things take a long time to develop and, and get put in place. But, you know, if the pandemic is, is going to affect Minnesota, it's going to affect it negatively for the reasons I talked about in, in my presentation, unfortunately. Um, you know, when you dissect the hospitality rebound since COVID started, if you can call it a rebound, it's been largely um, driven by leisure and not business. And um, some, at first I thought that was surprising and then it kind of made sense to me. Um, just because you know there is no business travel right now or very very little business travel obviously but people are still um taking you know vacations the same thing happened in the you know 2008 recession where people's budgets were crimped a little bit and they didn't buy the plane ticket but they you know they they went to the dells or they went to mall of america or or wherever they drove and the same thing i think is happening happening now uh, people aren't flying for business the question is, you know, does the Bloomington economy, does the Minneapolis-St. Paul economy see a permanent hit? I, I think the answer is yes. Um, I don't, I, I, bet it's, I bet it's one hotel room. I don't know how many beyond that it is, um, but there is some impact of COVID on our economy locally, and it's not good. And so how do we bolster that economy long-term? Thank you for that. Uh Mr. Mayor, uh, may I butt the line just very, very quickly? As I alluded to before we start, I have a time crunch problem tonight. Uh, it's a question for chairs and perhaps city attorney. Uh, might I be able to cast a vote, uh, prepay my vote <laughs> to leave the meeting a bit early, or is that a point of order that would not be permitted? Uh, that's a good question, Commissioner Lyons. I don't know. Um... Ms. Manderscheid, is, is there a provision for that to cast a vote ahead of time on something like this? In, in, uh, I, in alignment with what Shane had put in his presentation as for what the port authority vote would be. Uh, Mayor members, I'm not actually uh, counsel to the port authority, but I can say that under the city council's rules, uh, it would not be allowed. Okay. Well, perhaps what Commissioner Luntz can do if he wants to leave is just express his opinion whether he's supportive or not, and then we can take that into consideration. Okay. Uh, it will be very brief. I would My vote would be to approve uh, the, the uh, vote amendment as it's made, as written by Shane in his presentation materials at this time. And I apologize for the special dispensation, but I do have a do have something I've got to leave a little bit early for. So uh, I, I thank you, and uh, I'll look to see what the final vote is. Thank you, Commissioner Lawrence. Thank you, Commissioner. It's the time of year for special dispensation, Rob. You're fine, so we're good. It's, uh... <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. <laughs> Councilmember Coulter and then Councilmember Beloga. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Shane, I guess... Um, one question I have, um, sorry, um, you know, knowing obviously that that there are a lot of there, there aren't a lot of specifics, you know, for a reason. Um, would is it, I mean this this hypothetical legislation would one of the asks be in it to allow TIF dollars to be spent outside of TIF districts? Like, is, is it a, is it a geographic alteration as well as a use alteration that's being considered? Mr. Mayor and Councilmember Coulter, um, we had not thought of that um, because I think, you know, with the TIF pot that, that we have for the mall district, which is mostly what we're talking about here, that's the, the free TIF that Bloomington has. Um, that geographic area is the Industrial Development District 1, which is Old Airport South, now South Loop. And so I think all the projects would be geographically located there. Um, so we hadn't thought of uh, loosening up the geography on TIF. Um, others may want to do that. You know, if this legislation gets traction, um, other people may have that problem, so to speak. Um, but we hadn't, we hadn't thought of that at this point. 
Okay, okay, that that's a fine answer. So at, at the very least, it's fair to say that that's not the intent that that you're approaching this ask with tonight. That's correct. That's correct. Yep. Okay, thank you. And so I, I guess I just have a, a few thoughts here, and I I guess I would I would say I'm in a very similar boat to Councilmember Nelson. I'm I'm a little bit troubled by this ask in part frankly because of the the lack of specificity or actually well both the lack of specificity and in some sense also too much specificity you know if, if the ask were you know seek legislation to you know provide more tools for you know economic development and diversification i could probably get on board with that but the ask is, is, in this case, very specific. It's flexibility to existing TIF and or liquor and lodging statutes to support projects that deliver hospitality demand. And, you know, it, it's, I'm a little bit confused about sort of the nature of the overall issue. Because, you know, I, I asked earlier about the hotel rooms and we're, you know, you know we're just this year it looks like the estimate is being pretty close to what the average has been for several years. And you know, you also mentioned, and I, I get rumors are just that rumors, so we don't want to necessarily put stock in them. But there, I mean, there certainly have been discussions about other potential hotel rooms. And you know, a couple of things that were said earlier kind of stuck out to me. You know, that there is, you know, a huge amount of interest in residential. That there, there are other proposals in the pipeline, and. I guess my 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 thought is, I mean, based on some based on that and on some of the descriptions that we've heard about, uh, you know, things that are going on in the mall, lieutenants and that kind of thing. I I guess my I'm it, it's not, I mean, you know, the numbers are what they are, but you know what we have heard seems to me to suggest that that there there is not it, the the issue is not necessarily demand. At least, and I, you know, I don't have a background in business, so I'm not going to pretend that I do. But at least as I understand demand, it doesn't sound like that's the issue. It sounds more to me like it's it's a question of of ability or you know concern for for health and safety rather than a desire for folks to um, you know visit these attractions and and stay in hotels and so on. I mean, you know, hotel developers, you know. They come into a place because they think there's going to be a market for them, and if there is still interest in hotel rooms in Bloomington, some folks must at least think there's a market for more hotel rooms there. And you know, it, it just it feels to me a little bit like we're 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 kind of the dog that caught the car. You know, we we have had these hotel rooms, and we, you know we have you know all you know all of these hotel rooms, and now all of a sudden we're here. Oh, we need to create demand for hospitality. And I, you know, I guess just thinking about the the goals that that are that you know the stated goals for the South Loop area, which you know I understand this is not specific to the South Loop area, but it's it's certainly been our focus here tonight. And and you mentioned of course the Mall of America TIF that would be would be presumably focused in in the South Loop area. You know, we we've talked about increasing and broadening the tax base. And transitioning to you know and promoting high density mixed use development and and a walkable urban neighborhood and you know I will just tell you you know one of the one of the most common things that I I have has been mentioned to me over the last year as we thought about the economy and the budget challenges and so on that we've had is is folks saying that we are we are too reliant on hospitality we are too reliant on the Mall of America. And it it feels to me a bit like this is I mean and and I think you know as as the council we have I think every one of us has mentioned that 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 that's a concern and this to me just feels a little bit like we're we're going in the opposite direction of addressing that concern and I I I am just really having a hard time supporting this particular ask tonight I you know this this just you know, I, I don't doubt that 
the the hospitality industry is hurting, um, but a, a lot of folks are are hurting, and I I and I I'm just not I'm really not comfortable with this, and and you know I I guess I would say it's it it's always something of a crapshoot, of course, if there's even going to be a tax bill in any given legislative session, um, and to the extent that there is, it's usually pretty finely negotiated. <sighs> You know, knowing knowing that we are where I mean we're almost halfway through the legislative session now, things will start heating up. You know, if I I to be frank, I'm I'm just really not comfortable supporting this proposal tonight. If we have to make a decision tonight, I I don't know that I can vote in favor of it. If it's something that we can come back to um and have you know further discussion on, further refine. You know the the philosophy and the kinds of proposals that that this kind of thing would be uh, geared toward. Um, I you know I might be able to get there. And, and as an example, um, Shane, you, you mentioned the the TIF purists at the Capitol, and maybe it's just because our office moved closer to to Anne Rest, but I'm kind of becoming one of those TIF purists. Um, but I I could see perhaps some more flexibility as far as liquor and lodging tax revenues. Um, but I, I, you know, to Council Member Nelson's point as well, TIF exists for a very specific purpose, and I, I am, I am very, very reticent to use it other than the specific purpose it's designed for. So I've, I've been kind of rambly here, but that's, that's just kind of where I am. I'm, I'm just really uncomfortable with this proposal tonight. Council Member Beloga. Thank you. My full question was asked by uh, Councilmember Coltier, and it was uh, with respect to geographic uh, uh, nature of the, uh, with respect to TIF districts. So I'll take any more time than that. So very good, Councilmember Loman. Thank you, uh, Mayor and uh, President Erickson. Uh, so just a question for uh, 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 Shane. Uh, I, I've seen recently these uh, TIF uh, tourism counties. Do you know what those are? And can you help me understand what, what, what those are? Those are? Mr. Mayor and Councilmember Lohman, can, can you repeat that? TIF tourism what? TIF tourism counties. You know, they're basically uh, 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 the northern Minnesota. Uh, I, I don't know much about it. I just happened to, to see a little bit about that before I got into the meeting. I was reading a little bit more about uh, TIF, and I wasn't sure if you knew a little bit more about those TIF. They're what are called TIF counties. Mr. Mayor and uh, Councilmember Lohman, I, I don't know that I know about that. Um, I know that we do have Julie Eddington, or we did. Um, Carolyn, would you mind promoting Julie to the group here as well? If she's still here, she might have an answer to that. Good evening, everyone. This is Julie. Um, I, you know, we, I've seen the legislation with respect to TIF improvement districts, but I am not aware of so-called TIF counties. Yeah. yeah, I don't know much Mr. about them either. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, we can do some research um, on that. If you wouldn't mind sending a link or something, um, we can follow up with uh, with some more information. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I, I just, I'm just curious about that. You know, you know, if those exist or if there you know, is this potential legislation. I know I, I'm just looking at the, the house research um, area, so that, that's where I'm more I'm finding it. So uh, I'm just curious about that. I know there's some, some thinking around that. Um, so I guess what my, my question would be, Shane, I know I, I've listened to this, the, this presentation uh, that we've had here today. Um, and I think, you know, part of why it, you know, TIF is set up the way that it is, is to, to try to protect uh, taxpayers. And I, and I know, um, you know, I certainly want to you know, protect taxpayers uh, um, as we go about this, not only Bloomington uh, taxpayers, but, you know, Minnesota taxpayers, because, you know, certainly uh, the work that we do within the hospitality industry or with the mall certainly impacts that. And so I guess what my question would be in terms of, and I know you don't have specifics, um, 
what would be the risk that we are putting forward the, the further risk within this particular proposal that would impact taxpayers uh the, the changes that we are seeking around the hospitality industry help me understand what those those may be if i were as a council member uh to support uh this particular proposal thank you mr mayor and council member loman um let me see i, I think the risks um, for supporting the action tonight um, are, are really policy ones. Um, they're political capital, uh, potential bad press from the TIF purists and, and things like that. And I, I don't mean uh, to say that TIF purists are either good or bad. I, I, uh, I certainly don't mean to, to denigrate that. I, I understand uh, why the TIF statute is what it is. And in normal times, obviously, um, we fully support doing what we do, but Bloomington has greatly benefited from um, TIF through time. I think we've demonstrated that. Um, so the risks tonight, I think, are, are um, certainly not financial. We're talking about existing money in this example of using TIF um, that the mall has generated and it is currently governed by the development contract that the Port and Council have executed with them. So there's, there's no additional burden to the Bloomington taxpayer and um, certainly could be argued that there's only upside. So there's really, there's no financial risk um, being talked about, and, and certainly not tonight with, uh, with the waypoint that you have on this one, the decision. Um, certainly later, uh, as projects would be developed, uh, again, we propose the details of those projects and risks and benefits, you know, could then come into focus. But um, sitting here tonight, I don't, I don't see that there are a lot of financial risks. I hope I'm not missing something, but yeah. And so I can assume that um, uh, that uh, by what you're saying, that even if there are those types of risks that may come from uh, legislation that may be adopted, uh, that supported, um, if we were to pass this, we would have the opportunity to vote it down. I mean, we would be able to look at the particular project um, as we have done in the past and say, you know, we don't we don't really want to want to do that. Um, is, is, the, is my understanding uh, of that, is that correct? Yes, uh, Mayor and Council Member Loman, that, that, that's exactly right. So, again, tonight we're not talking about any specific project. Um, we're just, you know, asking the council if they want us to go and and seek changes from the legislature that would allow us to propose these projects. Um, because very likely they won't happen without the special tools. Now, I would never say never. Um, we'll continue to work on the full slate of projects that the council in Port want us to work on, obviously, but um, this just makes them a lot more likely if we were able to be successful on getting legislation. Um, yeah, so that this is one waypoint of, again, many, as I point out with the water park project, I think, you know, there was seven, eight, council meetings and of course you hadn't made a final decision on that project but um, any big project is going to see multiple uh, decision points like that as we work on term sheets and, and get you know input from the council on what they do and don't like in the proposal and, and so on and um, yep so really what this is doing is uh, essentially uh, we would have a seat at the table as we get ready to negotiate uh, with the state with our expertise and our understanding of, of what the mall has to offer, not only for Bloomington, but generally for the for the region uh, that we represent. Uh, this would give us the opportunity to have that, uh, those negotiations as we're looking at the state level uh, 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 information. You know, it's certainly, I, I, I certainly share those concerns. I know that Kurt, I know we've talked about that, that I, you know, if you want to put purist on my, I know on my, on my on my hat, you know, I'm I'm more in, in that that camp, but I, as I look at this, I really don't see that. I, I think that there's an opportunity to be a little more in, innovative here and to have conversations, um, really at the state level, and and we can continue to have our strong values in terms of protecting our taxpayers, while sitting at the table and being able to have that conversation. That's the way that I'm looking at this, uh, but, uh, um, 
I, I, I'm still not seeing what the risk is. And so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, maybe other council members can help me understand uh, what they're seeing. So if I could uh, just chime in here really quick. I, um, so we had the discussion through the spring and into the summer and into the fall with the Mall of America, uh, a disagreement about the use of this, uh, the, 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 the TIF resource, the TIF uh, resources that we have in the South Loop. And I think what we, we stressed as a city was that we didn't want to see that, that, that TIF resource that we had to be used for, for operating expenses. And what we said very specifically was that we wanted to make sure that we had resources to at, at our disposal when we came out to the, the other side of this pandemic. And I think this is an example of what we were talking about when we said those resources that could be available at, on the other side of this pandemic. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I guess, yeah, I, if, if we're getting into a purity test here, yeah, I was a, a, a Puritan there in terms of, of TIF not being used for operating expenses, wanted it to be more used for capital expenses, but also do understand that this is an opportunity that um, we can add a tool to our tool, to our, to our tool chest. Uh, we don't have to use it. I think there would be uh, checks and balances along the way. There would be many decision points along the way. But what it does, it just gives us one more tool to then consider how we move forward, how we try and support the hospitality industry in Bloomington, but frankly, folks, uh, uh, across the metropolitan area and acro across Minnesota. We all know what a driver that uh, the city of Bloomington and the Mall of America are for hospitality in the state of Minnesota. We absolutely know that. Um, we had a, uh, a previous city manager who would always use the analogy that, uh, we're, that the city is like a shark, that if we don't keep swimming and moving forward, uh, we're going to be in a bad way. And I think that's one thing to consider here. Uh, yes, the, the numbers may be uh, looking good. Uh, they, they've had some promising weekends at the Mall of America, but I would agree with Shane. The, the tourism industry has been affected and permanently affected, and we've got to find ways to continue to, uh, to work with it. It's an important part of the Bloomington economy. Whether or not uh, we're able to, to diversify it, and I certainly hope we are, uh, right now, tourism and hospitality are a very important part of our economy, and we need to uh, we need to look for ways to to do what we can uh, to support and and don't don't mince the words, don't don't twist the words and say to support the Mall of America. No, we're supporting the hospitality industry in Bloomington. That is the Mall of America. That's the bars. That's the restaurants. That's the hotels. That's all of the people that work in them. That's the the uh, the small companies that supply. The, the soap that do the, the, the do the laundry that do all the different pieces that keep all of this industry this huge industry going and um, I, I think we have an opportunity to look for another tool here we're not making a decision on any one project here we're adding a tool to the tool belt and um, and again with the with this notion of with um, you know the purity of tiff and tiff is tiff is a complicated thing and always has been and I know it's a, it's a point of contention for a lot of folks. But I do know uh, that it has been used in the past in tough economic times. It's been there's been flexibility. It's been loosened. Um, uh, Mr. Verbrugge, help me here remember some of the specifics. But I, I know I can I, I can recall times in the past when the legislature has loosened the requirements around TIF specifically during difficult economic times during recessions to help cities to help industries uh, get to the other side of the recession. Mr. Verbrugge, can you help me with the specifics there? Sure, Mr. Mayor and council members and uh, port commission members. Um, after the after the uh, Great Recession, the legislature did pass a package of um, TIF um, flexibility uh, policies. In fact, uh, Bloomington uh, Representative Ann Lincheski was the chair of the tax committee when those were pushed through, and uh, they were they were temporary. Uh, flexibilities at the time. So they did a number of things. They extended um, district, uh, the, the time on districts. Uh, they, they changed some of the knockdown rules. Uh, it, it just, it was intended to try and uh, give cities uh, more tools to um, help through the recovery. Uh, and it's, um, it was a four year uh, temporary policy recognizing that there was a certain amount of uh, time that had to be allowed because you know, the recovery was going to be uh, not a one year or a two year thing. It was gonna be a long-term thing. And if you look at that period as it relates to our hospitality industry, 
uh, the, the impact to our uh, lodging sector during the Great Recession uh, took five years to recover and get back to the uh, period it was uh, prior to 2008. And Shane, you can check me on those numbers if I'm if I'm off base a little bit. Um, <clears throat> we have even uh, in the last couple of years gone to the legislature and been able to secure TIF flexibility. So with uh, the FPCS, we uh, got some extension of time periods. This is not unusual to go and ask for um, the flexibility on TIF districts. Um, so it's it's not, uh, I think, out of step with what the legislature is talking about this year. In fact, the impact to the hospitality industry across the state is driving uh, a lot of concern among legislators. Just this week, I saw a bipartisan proposal uh, to abate the uh, state share of taxes for uh, uh, for hotels and uh, give them an opportunity to um, try and, and restabilize financially. And the, the other thought I had, uh, getting back to the comments that Council Member Coulter made, um, is absolutely right about the need to diversify our economy. And the Council has talked about this. In fact, we're going to spend some more time talking about it this weekend during our, uh, our council retreat. Because of important issues uh, that the council identified here. And uh, I, I would simply say it's not an or proposition uh, to uh, try to uh, invest in the hospitality industry or diversify the local economy. I think it's an and proposition. And the fact is that uh, uh, it's not going to the, the the presence of retail hospitality as a major uh, industry in Bloomington is not going to change. And uh, the, the tools that we're potentially talking about are tools that are going to help us stimulate that recovery uh, and ideally do so so that we don't have this five-year period like we did after the Great Recession. And we're going to diversify our, I think that's an absolute imperative, but I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Council member Nelson, council member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, mayor. Um, just like to ask one follow-up question on that. Has anyone ever asked the legislature for flexibility to pay for private development? Mr. Mayor and uh, Councilmember Nelson, um, what I'd like to do, I think, is invite Julie Eddington to talk about um, a little bit about the different types of TIF districts and the money and how TIF can be spent because each district, each type of TIF, TIF district has different rules. And so the mall TIF district is a redevelopment district which specifically disallows that TIF money be spent inside a project. And there's different types of TIF districts that allow the money to go inside the project. So again, we're maybe getting caught up in talking about the Mall of America, which is just the example. And I don't think we're talking about, um, anyway, uh, I think I'll stop and let Julie Eddington talk about the different districts and where TIF can be spent inside the different district, depending on the district. Julie, are you still with us? I am, I am. Um, so there's several different types of TIF districts. Redevelopment district you can only use for um, land acquisition, uh, contamination, uh, cleanup, and infrastructure. H housing TIF districts you can use the tax increment to build buildings. Um, uh, renewal districts are this very similar to redevelopment districts. And then we've got economic development districts that allow um, the use for land acquisition and um, infrastructure. Um, that said, um, in the 2011 legislation that Jamie was talking about earlier, um, they gave broad flexibility to use um, the tax increment from any district um, for uh, construction, and they specifically did that to help with construction jobs and get development going after the recession. Um, 
and so there is a, there is a broad broad use of tax increment along those different types of districts. I would also tell you that um, in any district, we can use tax increment for a parking garage and or surface parking, things like that. Okay. Councilmember Nelson, um, just to highlight, so in housing dis districts, the TIF money goes into the building itself. That's, that's the takeaway from that. The redevelopment districts, it can't. And so that's the fundamental difference here. Thank you for the clarification. Um, and then just on the TIF district that we're talking about, uh, what property is not owned by Triple Five? In the TIF districts themselves, the property is owned by Triple Five, but the TIF um, development district is all of Southwood. So okay. the TIF can be spent anywhere in Southwood. Okay, thank you. Mr. President, if I may, I see uh, Council, uh, Commissioner Peterson with his hand up, and I know that Commissioner Keller is also logged in looking to speak. I don't mind to uh, step on your toes here. I, I appreciate you doing that because I can't see them, and so thank you much, and, and let's have them speak. Absolutely. Commissioner Peterson? Uh, thank you, and you know, I'm, I checked off for 2021 being called council member there. I heard that down there. Um, the, uh, the thing I want to talk about a little bit is the... And, and we had quite a bit of discussion on this in the budget committee, which is about the supposed dependency of Bloomington or over dependency of Bloomington on hospitality revenues. And I think it's it's really important to kind of understand the big picture historical context and how Bloomington has really been an overperformer in a couple different ways, going back to the late 1950s and early 1960s, when Bloomington put an enormous amount of effort into building up its commercial industrial tax base during that period to the point where other cities who were unhappy with how successful we were at it ended up going to the legislature and passing the Fiscal Disparities Act, which ended up redirecting a bunch of property tax revenue that the city generated into a pool that was shared in the metro area because we were so successful at getting commercial industrial development into the city. Um, and then when the, the um, stadium ended up closing, uh, we had the vision at the city, and this is before my time, um, of really going and looking at what we could put in that location that would be a unique and differentiated uh, sort of development in that area. And for those who paid attention to the projects at that point, if, 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 if we had not gone down the path of a project like the project that ended up uh, um, where Triple Five ended up developing it, likely what we would have ended up with in that point would have been a bunch of big box retail um, on pads there and if you go around and look at the state of big box retail in other parts of the metro area, you know that that's not, that would not have been a great uh, development option for the city. Um, instead, what we got is we got an enduring asset that really in the metro area is one of the, the three kind of large scale real retail properties that people you know, widely believe are the ones that are gonna survive the shakeout in the shopping center business and a really unique and differentiated uh, hospitality property um, that we ended up having. And so I, I, don't, I don't know that Bloomington is over-dependent on hospitality. I, I would never say we're over-dependent on commercial industrial. I think we exceed anybody's expectations in that area. And when something unusual comes along like this, of course, we're going to be impacted by it more because we have more exposure to that particular area. But I think, you know, particularly to the council members, um, if, if you go and talk to your peers in other cities and say, hey, how about, how about we give you our Bloomington's hospitality industry and you take the tax revenue from it and you have that in your city. I, that's, that's something that every city is envious of our city is having. And the fact that um, we had a pandemic come along and for a year or so we're having trouble with it um, and that we're gonna turn our back on it at that point, I think that's, that's the wrong thing to do for the city. Um, we need to keep looking for things like the work we did in the commercial industrial in the 60s and 70s, like the the hospitality business that we have now to add to that portfolio, but it doesn't mean we should turn our back on those areas just because we have more of it than other parts of the, the metro area. Commissioner Keller. Hi, uh, well, first let me apologize for extending this evening just for, so I can say a few sentences. Uh, I've been, I think this is my 19th year on the Port Authority. 
and I can count on the fingers of one hand, if I can remember them all, how many times I have really questioned something that's been put before me. Um, and I didn't, in this case, until the discussion, frankly. Um, so I want to make up points and, and make sort of point slash question. So uh, Councilman Coulter kind of really got to me with a couple of points, particularly the specificity thing. And, and and I, I feel there's a little bit of, of um, uh, inconsistency in the discussion about this point, which is, um, is this too specific or is this too general? I, I get it would probably, I suppose, be difficult to go to the legislature and be vague and say, can we kind of have some tools? Um, I, 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 so I get that problem, uh, but I think Mr. Coulter makes a good point about it being perhaps too specific. And in that regard, um, actually some of the points being made in support of this, I think kind of flow the other direction. I, I think notwithstanding that this is not for the mall, I can imagine very easily this would be, our, our asking for this would be perceived widely as being a mall ask. Um, and um, I also was swayed by the idea that we, do have some other things to do, but I, I, I think she and I think your comment about the 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 spend, if you will, is political capital. I don't know that I want to spend my political capital on this. And I recall a lot of a lot of talk about a lot of legislation over a lot of years, and and having to to use political capital. I, I, I think perhaps we need to husband that resource a little bit more carefully. And it, mind you, I haven't entirely made up my decision yet. Um, and and then I kind of have this comment question. The, the other point of inconsistency that I think I'm hearing is, on the one hand, this is not a COVID relief movement, but on the other hand, uh, because it's, the projects take forever and that kind of stuff, but I'm hearing a lot of support from people because it's a COVID relief thing. So I, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the reality of that is. Um, and I, so all in all, I, I, at the end of the day, my my concern is about the values expression it, it, that it makes, uh, whether whether it's intended or not. Uh, all of the people we're going to go to the Capitol to discuss it with will not have heard this discussion, uh, and may and purist in particular may very well see this as um, as a mall bill, but also as something that's an ask that uh, we'll spend some capital that we might want to use someplace else. So um, again, I have been pretty much uniformly behind everything that's been presented. The staff does an amazing job and all is well researched and well considered before being put for either of these bodies. Um, but I, I, I'm very much leaning in the direction of, of, um, of a negative take on this thing for the for those reasons. And I, I, I thank you all, by the way, for your considered opinions, because I feel much more fully engaged in understanding this now than I did before this meeting started. That, that's all for me. Well, Mr. President, I believe all council members have had their Say, uh, any additional commissioners wishing to speak on this? If not, Mr. President, I think uh, we're probably to a decision point one way or another. We have our uh, the actions laid out. And uh, oh, I see uh, Council Member Carter. Council Member Carter? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Sorry, just one quick question. Um, has Have we had any conversations or have you guys had any conversations with the League of Cities? League of Minnesota cities about this and what maybe like other cities are thinking about doing. I mean, I'm sure there's lots, lots of us struggling. So, um, have any of those conversations happened? Shane, have you broached this with the Mayor, league yet? Mayor and Council Member Carter, no, not specifically this proposal with the league. Um, we have previewed for a number of folks that we've talked to that, um, have asked us about this, frankly, because we had a lot of legislative meetings throughout 2020, um, separate from the mall, and there was a great desire by a lot of legislators 
and um, and others for the city and the mall to um, come to an agreement on something in 2020. And obviously, we did not do that. And um, but here we are, you know, this year. And so people have asked us, you know, hey, you guys been working with the mall um, and others uh, on on projects that can help hospitality. Some people ask about hospitality. Some people ask about what they remember from 2020. And um, so specifically with the league, we haven't, um, just in the past um, 24 hours, there's been a couple of bills introduced related to tip flexibility and hospitality relief, frankly. And so um, there is going to be a push at the Capitol, whether we're in directly involved in it with what we're talking about tonight or not for, for just those things. And so um, there's a decent probability that you know, should we decide to move forward with this tonight, that that would be successful because I know there's a lot of people, um, you know, in St. Paul that were interested in in, in doing that. Um, with the league specifically, um, we haven't talked to them specifically about this proposal. No. So can you clarify for um, even those watching? What has changed from the 2020 conversations at the legislature with MOA as it relates to TIF to now? Sure. Mayor and Council Member Carter, my AirPods are gonna go dead. <laughs> so I'm gonna switch headphones here. Just bear with me a second. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes, we can. Sorry about that. Um, Mayor and Council Member Carter, the, um, what's changed in 2020 versus now is in 2020, the mall was asking for uh, the use of TIF to fund debt service payments and operating expenses. And um, the city opposed that. And um, we had numerous meetings at the monthly, at a monthly clip um, as there was a special session happening every month um, uh, to oppose that. Um, what we're asking for now is, is again, much more broad ask because we don't know exactly um, what is available out there and what is pal palatable both to you all and to legislators as it relates to hospitality relief. We know there's going to be a drive for flexibility and hospitality relief. We don't know how it's going to shake out over the next couple of months, um, but we think there's an opportunity. And so very different from 2020. Um, the ask then was for operating like expense where? help. Well, I'm sorry. But it was for help with operating expenses, which the city opposed, um, with the stated goal of wanting to build projects, to save that money to build projects. And so now what we're doing is we're trying to build those projects. And um, you have a decision point tonight to save that money and, and use the TIF in the way that we have been using it in the past. Um, or try to supercharge that development by putting the money directly into some of those projects uh, and making those decisions later. But two very different uses of, of TIF. Councilmember Carter, anything else? Councilmember Nelson, I saw your hand up and now I see it's down. Did you have a question? No, you're good. All right. Mr. President, yes, Commissioner Hunt. It, uh, the, you know, a lot of a lot of discussion back and forth and meritorious on both sides. And and one thing that the city's always been done has has been is creative and so forth. So I like the part about having something discussion somewhat open. But my concern is depending on that that to make sure whatever projects there might be, and I don't want it lip service, and I'm not suggesting we've done that in the past, but looking at things and not getting things too far ahead with the assumption that we're going to be doing that because it is should this pass and discussions prevail um, about um, putting um, additional funds into South Loop. I wanna make sure that we'd have that true sense of what is that going to be? And what might that um, those particular projects be, and so forth? I should look at my camera here instead of my monitor here. But um, w making sure that we actually have the time to really digest whatever those end uses might be, 
and that we're not giving an open ticket and being blindsided after after the fact um, by anything. And again, not necessarily suggesting that would happen, but that's always a, a, um, a great concern. Well, thank you, Commissioner Hunt. I mean, I think with regard to that, the thing that this this does not talk about any specific project or anything, and that would have to go then through the the normal process. So, the the issue really on the table, as I see it, is are do we are we willing to to support getting some additional flexibility? Obviously, with legislation, you don't know what that is until it's passed, and there's other people that are going to be involved. But this is something that would not be. Uh, specific to Bloomington, it would be a statewide kind of thing, and uh, so I, as as I look at it, that's that's the issue. And uh, you know, I, in in general, as we, we've gone through these kinds of things, and I think with the changing times, uh, I, I've never been a fan of TIF in general, but but it's something that I felt in, in my role in in the Port Authority, and that is it's 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 my job to see that we use it to the best benefit for the benefit of Bloomington because it's there and, and it's something that's a competitive advantage for Bloomington to have. So I think uh, we're, we're really probably at the point where Mr. Mayor, unless other people have something that I, I, th I think just by the, the way the actions are written, this is something that uh, has to come before the council first. And then as I read it, the, the port su supports what you've done or not done. So. I think you're right, Mr. President. And uh, so officially, Council, I, I think one way or another, let's uh, let's make a decision on this. And uh, with the, the action that's written in front of us here, the, um, the uh, I, I will make a motion to direct staff to add the following provision to the city's legislative policy to seek legislation to add flexibility to existing TIF and or liquor and lodging statutes in order to support projects that deliver hospitality demand. Councilmember Lowman, I see your hand up. Yeah, I I, um, uh, I don't want to slow this down. I just uh, uh, Councilmember Lowman, but before we get a comment, if we if we could get a, a a second one way or another, and then we'll have discussion. How about that? Oh, well, Matt, Matt, my hand was actually up before that, but I, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. It's a it's it's a challenge with the screens. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, we got a second though. Yeah, I think Jack. Uh, All right, so we we do have a motion and a second now, Councilmember Lowman. Question? I'm sorry. So yeah, it may be moot now. My question for you and for Shane was, would it make sense to uh, adjust uh, the uh, the motion to try to, um, uh, for those folks who are concerned about uh, uh, taxpayers, um, uh, to add something to it uh, uh, to, to help with that? Uh, did, did you have specific legislature or specific language in mind, council member? I did not. I wanted to just see. Uh, I know Shane, you've been listening to the uh, uh, to the concerns of other council members, and I thought maybe staff might have a recommendation that might uh, help some uh, council members to 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 get behind this. Council, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mr. Redling, Mayor, Councilmember Lowman. Um, in in listening to the comments from the port and council. It, it seems to me like there um, are concerns and we're just kind of generally calling them to purist, even though um, it's probably an imperfect term. Um, but, um, you know, a general, I don't want to say disagreement or maybe just a discussion about the, the use of TIF uh, in particular. TIF, and we're focused on TIF again. We've used TIF as the example, but um, the motion is related to liquor and lodging too, because again, we don't know how the winds um, in St. Paul will blow over the next couple of months. And so we wanted to have um, direction from the council to be able to, to affect legislation um, in, in many different ways. Again, not making decisions on any projects, just allowing the tools to be there. So it seems to me like there's a discussion um, about, you know, how you use TIF in certain projects. And some folks want to do that and others don't. I think, um, Councilmember Lohman, you made the, con the concern about um, protecting taxpayers. I don't 
again, I, unless I'm missing something, I don't see how this, you know, affects the, the median value home in Bloomington negatively. Um, I think it only long term affects it positively. And unless I'm missing something, thinking off the cuff here. So um, I know that some people <laughs> wanted more specificity in the motion. Um, of course, you know, we, you guys can do that if you'd like. Um, and other people wanted it, you know, wider. And so, again, we tried to write it so that, you know, we can we can roll with the punches in St. Paul. But um, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question very, very well. No, yeah, I, I, I think you're, yeah, I think you're struggling with the same thing that I am. It's hard to put words uh, to that because there are, they are in several different uh, uh, veins. So maybe we're better off just leaving it as it is, but I wanted to just uh, take one attempt to try to, um, I, but I do see it as you see it. So I think, I think, unless Mayor, you've, you see it differently. Uh, how about Councilmember Loman? I, I think I, I at least see the direction that you're headed there, and um, I would be willing to amend my motion to to say that to ask the legis to, to amend the legislative policy that we would seek legislation to add temporary flexibility to existing TIF and or liquor lodging statutes, uh, so we can put you know temporary however long that would be, but that would uh, that that might be protection in the long run if that's what you're thinking. Is that would that be adequate? Do you think? I think so. I mean, I, I, I'm fully in support of how it is now. So I'm just trying to uh, grasp from what I've heard. Uh, but I think that that's what I've heard. I think that would help. Uh, let's 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 start there unless somebody else uh, would like to speak up. All right. Well, then I, uh, I, I would move to amend my motion to uh, to add the word temporary. So seek legislation to temporarily to add temporary flexibility to existing TIF and or liquor and lodging statutes. Uh, our seconder, uh, Council Member Beloga, are you amenable to that? I am. Thank you much. I think that uh, that also makes it uh, more consistent with past legislation uh, in terms of what we've seen the legislature making, uh, making, um, allowing flexibility with TIF. Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, since we got a motion on the table, I just. Uh, I'm not going to be able to support this tonight. At this point, uh, one of the primary reasons is I haven't heard from the hospitality industry um, overall in terms of how they think this might help them. Um, the request didn't come from the Convention Bureau or from any of the hotels or any of that. I, I strongly support them. They've gone through an absolutely unimaginably difficult time and um, have as have our restaurants, as have our retailers, and the mall included in that. I, I don't uh, doubt that for a minute. Um, but in my mind, this is just way too vague to put uh, taxpayer money into private projects that may help uh, spur uh, something is is a little bit difficult for me to understand. I think that. Um, there are ways of looking at this. Uh, people have brought up the geographical um, issue and, and uh, taking and addressing that. People have maybe looked at um, other types of things that may help in the South Loop in terms of the entire vision, the diversification, you know, utilizing TIF to help support like a grocery store, one of those things that we know will be an attraction to that area for other development type projects. Um, I just, um, without that, broader fuller conversation of, of what this is and, and how it how we actually could help um I, I just at this point having a, a vague idea of what we might do is is just not something i can support so thank you council member council member coulter i saw your hand up and now it's down would you did you want to weigh in council member nelson put it far better than i could so i'll just leave it with him very good Council, is there any further discussion? Mr. Mayor. Council Member Beloga. I would like to call the question. Council Member Beloga has called the question. Uh, without Second. Ms. Christensen here with us this evening, um, I get to call the roll. Carolyn. So, all right. I, I will do it. Oh, okay. Carolyn, uh, why don't you do it then officially? Okay. Bussy? Aye. Beloga? Aye. Carter. No. Coulter. 
No. Loman? Aye. Martin? No. Nelson? No. Thank you. The vote is four no, three yes. So, so Mr. Mayor, considering that action, I guess it's it's uh, there's no action for the Port Authority to to take at this juncture. Not sure if the uh, mayor can hear us or if we can hear the mayor. Mayor's on mute. There, I unmuted you. Amy, are you able to hear me? You are able to hear me. Okay, now. So people are able to hear me. Can anyone hear Carolyn? Was she able to complete the vote? I, I, yes, she completed the vote. Yes, I completed it. someone else talk. Jamie, can you chime in, please? What's going on yep. here? Uh, Mr. Mayor, can you hear us or not? I can't hear you at all. We're okay. completely dead here in the, uh, the council chambers. All right. Well, uh, I think everybody else was able to hear. Can I just have everybody give a thumbs up that the motion failed on a vote of four to three uh, against? And uh, President Erickson. Uh, everybody just stand by. I see. Uh, I think we're trying to solve this here. Grant is working feverishly. For those who are watching, the mayor is letting me know that they are completely dead in the council chambers, so can't hear us at all. What in the world happened? Apparently they can, the public can hear me and that's it, but they can hear each other right now. Well, we, we could always use the phone as a backup. All right, folks, I'm at a loss here. I can't hear a thing that's going on. Um, somebody suggested I should start singing, which I don't think I'll do. <laughs> I haven't done anything differently here, so I'm not sure what might have happened. It uh, just tripped off, so we can't hear anything. Um, Can he call in, Jamie? That's what I just suggested, uh, council members and port members, is if the mayor can call into the meeting. Uh, and also... I also have a uh, report that, you know, obviously believe what you see on social media and apparently on social media, there are reports of uh, rolling internet blackouts in Bloomington. So I'm huh. wondering if there's uh, something going on with the, with the provider. Can you hear me now? Because I'm, I'm now able to hear Jamie. I, I went to uh, just on my okay. iPad. So. Huh? Okay. Yeah, I can, I can hear you now, Mr. Mayor. Well, and I just had a report from another staff and that they were able to hear the mayor, but none of us. So, uh, yeah, the, great. Carol, Carolyn, the, uh, the WebEx is still recording though, correct? So we can just, when, when this meeting gets posted, we can make a note of technical difficulties at the two hour and 32 minute mark of the meeting or something along those lines. Uh, but to, to summarize, Mr. Mayor, the, the vote failed on, on the, uh, four to three uh, count. And uh, President Erickson uh, indicated that uh, in light of the council action, there's no uh, action necessary for the port unless you have additional comments there, President Erickson. No, I, I think that's an accurate summary, so. So I would-, I would... And I, I think from the 
from the meeting logistics perspective, um, we could hear the mayor the whole time. So I think the um, from the uh, from the public standpoint, we're good. It's just that the mayor, um, as the only person in the council chambers, was dead. At least on my end, I could hear everyone, including the mayor. And so, anyway, we don't need to believe at that point. Thanks. Okay. So, Mr. Mayor, I, I think, and I guess I would defer to Shane, or do we have other items that we would have on the agenda tonight? Nope, that is the only item tonight. Hey, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, President Erickson, if I might, just real quickly, we did have a, a another um, a concurrent meeting of the of the port and uh, council scheduled for Monday, March 15th. We're going to cancel that meeting or at least defer it uh, for some time. The, the uh, topic was going to be discussing the um, uh, USA Minnesota Expo 2027, and uh, there just isn't enough information currently to bring that discussion forward because uh, the issue hasn't advanced in Washington, DC. So we will double back with both bodies to find another date that will work for us. Uh, once we have more information out of DC. Okay, well, Mr. Mayor, I think if, if that's the case, um, we can uh, adjourn. So I would uh, uh, adjourn the Port Authority. And officially, I have to look for a motion to adjourn the council meeting. So moved. Second. A motion by Martin and a second by uh, Coulter to, to adjourn the council meeting. Hearing no further discussion, uh, Council Member Beloga. Aye. Council Member Carter. Aye. Council Member Coulter. Aye. Council Member Lohman. Aye. Council Member Martin. Aye. Council Member Nelson. Aye. And the mayor votes aye as well. So we are officially adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thanks for the discussion tonight. Thank, Thank you. you.